Section 21 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 of Plants. I think a designed and studied mechanism to be, in general, more evident in animals than in plants, and it is unnecessary to dwell upon a weaker argument where a stronger is at hand. There are, however, a few observations upon the vegetable kingdom which lie so directly in our way that it would be improper to pass by them without notice. The one great intention of nature in the structure of plants seems to be the perfecting of the seed, and, what is part of the same intention, the preserving of it until it be perfected. This intention shows itself, in the first place, by the care which appears to be taken to protect and ripen, by every advantage which can be given to them of situation in the plant, those parts which most immediately contribute to fructification, viz. the anthery, the stamina, and the stigmata. These parts are usually lodged in the center, the recesses, or the labyrinths of the flower. During their tender and immature state are shut up in the stalk or sheltered in the bud. As soon as they have acquired firmness of texture sufficient to bear exposure, and are ready to perform the important office which is assigned to them, they are disclosed to the light and air by the bursting of the stem or the expansion of the petals, after which they have, in many cases, by the very form of the flower during its blow, the light and warmth reflected upon them from the concave side of the cup. What is called also the sleep of plants is the leaves or petals disposing themselves in such a manner as to shelter the young stem, buds, or fruit. They turn up, or they fall down, according as this purpose renders either change of position requisite. In the growth of corn, whenever the plant begins to shoot, the two upper leaves of the stalk join together, embrace the ear, and protect it till the pulp has acquired a certain degree of consistency. In some water plants, the flowering and fecundation are carried on within the stem, which afterwards opens to let loose the impregnated seed. The pea, or papillionaceous tribe, enclose the parts of fructification within a beautiful folding of the internal blossom, sometimes called, from its shape, the boat or keel, itself also protected under a penthouse formed by the external petals. This structure is very artificial, and what adds to the value of it, though it may diminish the curiosity, very general. It has also this further advantage, and it is an advantage strictly mechanical, that all the blossoms turn their backs to the wind whenever the gale blows strong enough to endanger the delicate parts upon which the seed depends. I have observed this a hundred times in a field of peas in blossom. It is an aptitude which results from the figure of the flower, and, as we have said, is strictly mechanical, as much so as the turning of a weatherboard or tin cap upon the top of a chimney. Of the poppy, and of many similar species of flowers, the head, while it is growing, hangs down, a rigid curvature in the upper part of the stem giving to it that position, and in that position it is impenetrable by rain or moisture. When the head has acquired its size, and is ready to open, the stalk erects itself for the purpose, as it should seem, of presenting the flower, and, with the flower, the instruments of fructification, to the genial influence of the sun's rays. This always struck me as a curious property, and specifically, as well as originally, provided for in the constitution of the plant. For, if the stem be only bent by the weight of the head, how comes it to straighten itself when the head is the heaviest? These instances show the attention of nature to this principal object, the safety and maturation of the parts upon which the seed depends. In trees, especially in those which are natives of colder climates, this point is taken up earlier. Many of these trees, observe in particular the ash and the horse chestnut, produce the embryos of the leaves and flowers in one year, and bring them to perfection the following. There is a winter, therefore, to be gotten over. Now, what we are to remark is how nature has prepared for the trials and severities of that season. These tender embryos are, in the first place, wrapped up with a compactness which no art can imitate, in which state they compose what we call the bud. This is not all. The bud itself is enclosed in scales, which scales are formed from the remains of past leaves and the rudiments of future ones. Neither is this the whole. In the coldest climates, a third preservative is added, by the bud having a coat of gum or rosin, which, being congealed, resists the strongest frosts. On the approach of warm weather, this gum is softened, 
and ceases to be a hindrance to the expansion of the leaves and flowers. All this care is part of that system of provisions which has for its object and consummation the production and perfecting of the seeds. The seeds themselves are packed up in a capsule, a vessel composed of coats which, compared with the rest of the flower, are strong and tough. From this vessel projects a tube through which tube the farina, or some subtle fecundating effluvium that issues from it, is admitted to the seed. And here also occurs a mechanical variety, accommodated to the different circumstances under which the same purpose is to be accomplished. In flowers which are erect, the pistil is shorter than the stamina, and the pollen, shed from the anthery into the cup of the flower, is caught in its descent by the head of the pistil, called the stigma. But how is this managed when the flowers hang down? as does the crown imperial, for instance, and in which position the farina, in its fall, would be carried from the stigma and not towards it. The relative strength of the parts is now inverted. The pistil in these flowers is usually longer, instead of shorter, than the stamina, that its protruding summit may receive the pollen as it drops to the ground. In some cases, as in the nigella, where the shafts of the pistils or styles are disproportionably long, they bend down their extremities upon the anthery that the necessary approximation may be effected. But, to pursue this great work in its progress, the impregnation to which all this machinery relates, being completed, the other parts of the flower fade and drop off, whilst the gravid seed vessel, on the contrary, proceeds to increase its bulk, always to a great, and in some species, in the gourd, for example, and melon, to a surprising comparative size, assuming in different plants an incalculable variety of forms, but all evidently conducing to the security of the seed. By virtue of this process, so necessary but so diversified, we have the seed, at length, in stone fruits and nuts, encased in a strong shell, the shell itself enclosed in a pulp or husk, by which the seed within it is or hath been fed, or more generally, as in grapes, oranges, and the numerous kinds of berries, plunged overhead in a glutinous syrup, contained within a skin or bladder, at other times, as in apples and pears, embedded in the heart of a firm fleshy substance, or, as in strawberries, pricked into the surface of a soft pulp. These and many more varieties exist in what we call fruits. Footnote. From the confirmation of fruits alone, one might be led, even without experience, to suppose that part of this provision was destined for the utilities of animals, as limited to the plant, the provision itself seems to go beyond its object. The flesh of an apple, the pulp of an orange, the meat of a plum, the fatness of the olive, appear to be more than sufficient for the nourishing of the seed or kernel. The event shows that this redundancy, if it be one, ministers to the support and gratification of animal natures, and when we observe a provision to be more than sufficient for one purpose, yet wanted for another purpose, it is not unfair to conclude that both purposes were contemplated together. It favors this view of the subject to remark that fruits are not, which they might have been, ready altogether, but that they ripen in succession throughout a great part of the year, some in summer, some in autumn, that some require the slow maturation of the winter and supply the spring, also that the coldest fruits grow in the hottest places. Cucumbers, pineapples, melons are the natural produce of warm climates, and contribute greatly, by their coolness, to the refreshment of the inhabitants of those countries. I will add to this note the following observation communicated to me by Mr. Brinkley. Quote, the eatable part of the cherry or peach first serves the purposes of perfecting the seed or kernel by means of vessels passing through the stone, and which are very visible in a peach stone. After the kernel is perfected, the stone becomes hard, and the vessels cease their functions. But the substance surrounding the stone is not then thrown away as useless. That which was before only an instrument for perfecting the kernel now receives and retains to itself the whole of the sun's influence, and thereby becomes a grateful food to man. Also, what an evident mark of design is the stone protecting the kernel. The intervention of the stone prevents the second use from interfering with the first. Close quote. End of footnote. In pulse and grain and grasses, in trees and shrubs and flowers, the variety of the seed vessels is incomputable. We have the seeds, as in the pea tribe, regularly disposed in parchment pods which, though soft and membranous, completely exclude the wet even in the heaviest rains. 
the pod also not seldom, as in the bean, lined with a fine down. At other times, as in the senna, distended like a blown bladder. Or we have the seed enveloped in wool, as in the cotton plant, lodged, as in pines, between the hard and compact scales of a cone, or barricadoed, as in the artichoke and thistle, with spikes and prickles. In mushrooms, placed under a penthouse. In ferns, within slits in the back part of the leaf. Or, which is the most general organization of all, we find them covered by strong, close tunicles, and attached to the stem according to an order appropriated to each plant, as is seen in the several kinds of grains and of grasses. In which enumeration, what we have first to notice is, unity of purpose under variety of expedients. Nothing can be more single than the design, more diversified than the means. Pellicles, shells, pulps, pods, husks, skins, scales armed with thorns, are all employed in prosecuting the same intention. Secondly, we may observe that, in all these cases, the purpose is fulfilled within a just and limited degree. We can perceive that, if the seeds of plants were more strongly guarded than they are, their greater security would interfere with other uses. Many species of animals would suffer, and many perish, if they could not obtain access to them. The plant would overrun the soil, or the seed be wasted for want of room to sow itself. It is sometimes as necessary to destroy particular species of plants as it is at other times to encourage their growth. Here, as in many cases, a balance is to be maintained between opposite uses. The provisions for the preservation of seeds appear to be directed chiefly against the inconstancy of the elements or the sweeping destruction of inclement seasons. The depredation of animals and the injuries of accidental violence are allowed for in the abundance of the increase. The result is that, out of the many thousand different plants which cover the earth, not a single species, perhaps, has been lost since the creation. When nature has perfected her seeds, her next care is to disperse them. The seed cannot answer its purpose while it remains confined in the capsule. After the seeds, therefore, are ripened, the pericarpium opens to let them out, and the opening is not like an accidental bursting, but, for the most part, is according to a certain rule in each plant. What I have always thought very extraordinary, nuts and shells, which we can hardly crack with our teeth, divide and make way for the little tender sprout which proceeds from the kernel. Handling the nut, I could hardly conceive how the plantule was ever to get out of it. There are cases, it is said, in which the seed vessel, by an elastic jerk at the moment of its explosion, casts the seeds to a distance. We all, however, know that many seeds, those of most composite flowers, as of the thistle, dandelion, etc., are endowed with what are not improperly called wings, that is, downy appendages by which they are enabled to float in the air and are carried oftentimes by the wind to great distances from the plant which produces them. It is the swelling also of this downy tuft within the seed vessel that seems to overcome the resistance of its coats and to open a passage for the seed to escape. But the constitution of seeds is still more admirable than either their preservation or their dispersion. In the body of the seed of every species of plant, or nearly of every one, provision is made for two grand purposes. First, for the safety of the germ. Secondly, for the temporary support of the future plant. The sprout, as folded up in the seed, is delicate and brittle beyond any other substance. It cannot be touched without being broken. Yet, in beans, peas, grass seeds, grain, fruits, it is so fenced on all sides, so shut up and protected, that whilst the seed itself is rudely handled, tossed into sacks, shoveled into heaps, the sacred particle, the miniature plant, remains unhurt. It is wonderful also how long many kinds of seeds, by the help of their integuments, and perhaps of their oils, stand out against decay. A grain of mustard seed has been known to lie in the earth for a hundred years, and as soon as it had acquired a favorable situation, to shoot as vigorously as if just gathered from the plant. Then, as to the second point, the temporary support of the future plant, the matter stands thus. In grain and pulse and kernels and pippins, the germ composes a very small part of the seed. The rest consists of a nutritious substance from which the sprout draws its aliment for some considerable time after it is put forth is, until the fibers shot out from the other end of the seed are able to imbibe juices from the earth in a sufficient quantity for its demand. 
It is owing to this constitution that we see seeds sprout, and the sprouts make a considerable progress without any earth at all. It is an economy also in which we remark a close analogy between the seeds of plants and the eggs of animals. The same point is provided for in the same manner in both. In the egg, the residence of the living principle, the cicatrix, forms a very minute part of the contents. The white, and the white only, is expended in the formation of the chicken. The yolk, very little altered or diminished, is wrapped up in the abdomen of the young bird when it quits the shell, and serves for its nourishment till it have learnt to pick its own food. This perfectly resembles the first nutrition of a plant. In the plant, as well as in the animal, the structure has every character of contrivance belonging to it. In both, it breaks the transition from prepared to unprepared element. In both, it is prospective and compensatory. In animals which suck, this intermediate nourishment is supplied by a different source. In all subjects, the most common observations are the best, when it is their truth and strength which have made them common. There are, of this sort, two concerning plants, which it falls within our plan to notice. The first relates to, what has already been touched upon, their germination. When a grain of corn is cast into the ground, this is the change which takes place. From one end of the grain issues a green sprout, from the other a number of white fibrous threads. How can this be explained? Why not sprouts from both ends? Why not fibrous threads from both ends? To what is the difference to be referred but to design? To the different uses which the parts are thereafter to serve? Uses which discover themselves in the sequel of the process. The sprout, or plumule, struggles into the air and becomes the plant, of which, from the first, it contained the rudiments. The fibers shoot into the earth, and thereby both fix the plant to the ground and collect nourishment from the soil for its support. Now, what is not a little remarkable, the parts issuing from the seed take their respective directions into whatever position the seed itself happens to be cast. If the seed be thrown into the wrongest possible position, that is, if the ends point in the ground the reverse of what they ought to do, everything nevertheless goes on right. The sprout, after being pushed down a little way, makes a bend and turns upwards. The fibers, on the contrary, after shooting at first upwards, turn down. Of this extraordinary vegetable fact, an account has lately been attempted to be given. Quote, the plumule, it is said, is stimulated by the air into action and elongates itself when it is thus most excited. The radical is stimulated by moisture and elongates itself when it is thus most excited. Whence one of these grows upward in quest of its adapted object and the other downward. Close quote. Were this account better verified by experiment than it is, it only shifts the contrivance. It does not disprove the contrivance, it only removes it a little further back. Who, to use our author's own language, adapted the objects? Who gave such a quality to these connate parts as to be susceptible of different stimulation, as to be excited each only by its own element, and precisely by that which the success of the vegetation requires? I say, which the success of the vegetation requires, for the toil of the husbandman would have been in vain, his laborious and expensive preparation of the ground in vain, if the event must, after all, depend upon the position in which the scattered seed was sown. Not one seed out of a hundred would fall in a right direction. Our second observation is upon a general property of climbing plants, which is strictly mechanical. In these plants, from each knot or joint, or, as botanists call it, axilla of the plant, issue, close to each other, two shoots, one bearing the flower and fruit, the other drawn out into a wire, a long, tapering spiral tendril that twists itself round anything which lies within its reach. Considering that in this class two purposes are to be provided for, and together, fructification and support, the fruitage of the plant and the sustentation of its stock, what means could be used more effectual, or, as I have said, more mechanical, than what this structure presents to our eyes? Why or how, without a view to this double purpose, do two shoots of such different and appropriate forms spring from the same joint, from contiguous points of the same stalk? It never happens thus in robust plants or in trees. Quote, we see not, says Ray, so much as one tree or shrub or herb that hath a firm and strong stem, and that is able to mount up and stand alone without assistance, furnished with these tendrils. Close quote. Make only so simple a comparison as that between a pea and a bean. 
Why does the pea put forth tendrils, the bean not? But because the stalk of the pea cannot support itself, the stalk of the bean can. We may add also, as a circumstance not to be overlooked, that in the pea tribe these clasps do not make their appearance till they are wanted, till the plant has grown to a height to stand in need of support. This word support suggests to us a reflection upon a property of grasses, of corn, and canes. The hollow stems of these classes of plants are set at certain intervals with joints. These joints are not found in the trunks of trees or in the solid stalks of plants. There may be other uses of these joints, but the fact is, and it appears to be at least one purpose designed by them, that they corroborate the stem, which by its length and hollowness would otherwise be too liable to break or bend. Grasses are nature's care. With these she clothes the earth. With these she sustains its inhabitants. Cattle feed upon their leaves, birds upon their smaller seeds, men upon the larger. For few readers need be told that the plants which produce our bread corn belong to this class. In those tribes which are more generally considered as grasses, their extraordinary means and powers of preservation and increase, their hardiness, their almost unconquerable disposition to spread, their faculties of reviviscence coincide with the intention of nature concerning them. They thrive under a treatment by which other plants are destroyed. The more their leaves are consumed, the more their roots increase. The more they are trampled upon, the thicker they grow. Many of the seemingly dry and dead leaves of grasses revive and renew their verdure in the spring. In lofty mountains, where the summer heats are not sufficient to ripen the seeds, grasses abound which are viviparous, and consequently able to propagate themselves without seed. It is an observation likewise which has often been made, that herbivorous animals attach themselves to the leaves of grasses, and, if at liberty in their pastures to range and choose, leave untouched the straws which support the flowers. The general properties of vegetable nature, or properties common to large portions of that kingdom, are almost all which the compass of our argument allows to bring forward. It is impossible to follow plants into their several species. We may be allowed, however, to single out three or four of these species as worthy of a particular notice, either by some singular mechanism, or by some peculiar provision, or by both. 1. In Dr. Darwin's Botanic Garden, 1. 395, note, is the following account of the Vallisneria, as it hath been observed in the river Rhone. Quote, they have roots at the bottom of the Rhone. The flowers of the female plant float on the surface of the water and are furnished with an elastic spiral stalk which extends or contracts as the water rises or falls. This rise or fall, from the torrents which flow into the river, often amounting to many feet in a few hours. The flowers of the male plant are produced under water, and as soon as the fecundating farina is mature, they separate themselves from the plant, rise to the surface, and are wafted by the air or borne by the currents to the female flowers. Close quote. Our attention in this narrative will be directed to two particulars. First, to the mechanism, the elastic spiral stalk, which lengthens or contracts itself according as the water rises or falls. Secondly, to the provision which is made for bringing the male flower, which is produced under water, to the female flower which floats upon the surface. 2. My second example I take from Withering's Arrangement, Volume 2, page 209, edition 3. Quote, the Cascuta europea is a parasitical plant. The seed opens and puts forth a little spiral body which does not seek the earth to take root, but climbs in a spiral direction from right to left up other plants from which, by means of vessels, it draws its nourishment. Close quote. The little spiral body proceeding from the seed is to be compared with the fibers which seeds send out in ordinary cases, and the comparison ought to regard both the form of the threads and the direction. They are straight, this is spiral. They shoot downwards, this points upwards. In the rule and in the exception we equally perceive design. 3. A better known parasitical plant is the evergreen shrub called the mistletoe. What we have to remark in it is a singular instance of compensation. No art hath yet made these plants take root in the earth. Here, therefore, might seem to be a mortal defect in their constitution. Let us examine how this defect is made up to them. The seeds are endued with an adhesive quality so tenacious that if they be rubbed upon the smooth bark of almost any tree, they will stick to it. And then what follows? 
Roots springing from these seeds insinuate their fibers into the woody substance of the tree, and the event is that a mistletoe plant is produced the next winter. Of no other plant do the roots refuse to shoot in the ground. Of no other plant do the seeds possess this adhesive, generative quality when applied to the bark of trees. 4. Another instance of the compensatory system is in the autumnal crocus or meadow saffron, Colsicum autumnale. I have pitied this poor plant a thousand times. Its blossom rises out of the ground in the most forlorn condition possible, without a sheath, a fence, a calyx, or even a leaf to protect it, and that, not in the spring, not to be visited by summer suns, but under all the disadvantages of the declining year. When we come, however, to look more closely into the structure of this plant, we find that, instead of its being neglected, nature has gone out of her course to provide for its security and to make up to it for all its defects. The seed vessel, which in other plants is situated within the cup of the flower, or just beneath it, in this plant lies buried ten or twelve inches underground within the bulbous root. The tube of the flower, which is seldom more than a few tenths of an inch long, in this plant extends down to the root. The styles, in all cases, reach the seed vessel, but it is in this by an elongation unknown to any other plant. All these singularities contribute to one end. Quote, As this plant blossoms late in the year, and probably would not have time to ripen its seeds before the access of winter, which would destroy them, Providence has contrived its structure such that this important office may be performed at a depth in the earth out of reach of the usual effects of frost. Close quote. That is to say, in the autumn, nothing is done above ground but the business of impregnation which is an affair between the anthery and the stigmata, and is probably soon over. The maturation of the impregnated seed, which in other plants proceeds within a capsule, exposed together with the rest of the flower to the open air, is here carried on, and during the whole winter, within the heart, as we may say, of the earth, that is, out of the reach of the usual effects of frost. But then a new difficulty presents itself. Seeds, though perfected, are known not to vegetate at this depth in the earth. Our seeds, therefore, though so safely lodged, would, after all, be lost to the purpose for which all seeds are intended. Lest this should be the case, quote, a second admirable provision is made to raise them above the surface when they are perfected, and to sow them at a proper distance, close quote. Viz, the germ grows up in the spring upon a fruit stalk accompanied with leaves. The seeds now, in common with those of other plants, have the benefit of the summer, and are sown upon the surface. The order of vegetation externally is this. The plant produces its flowers in September, its leaves and fruits in the spring following. 5. I gave the account of the Dione muscipula, an extraordinary American plant, as some late authors have related it. But whether we be yet enough acquainted with the plant to bring every part of this account to the test of repeated and familiar observation, I am unable to say. Quote, its leaves are jointed and furnished with two rows of strong prickles, their surfaces covered with a number of minute glands, which secrete a sweet liquor that allures the approach of flies. When these parts are touched by the legs of flies, the two lobes of the leaf instantly spring up, the rows of prickles lock themselves fast together, and squeeze the unwary animal to death. Quote. Here, under a new model, we recognize the ancient plan of nature viz. the relation of parts and provisions to one another, to a common office, and to the utility of the organized body to which they belong. The attracting syrup, the rows of strong prickles, their position so as to interlock, the joints of the leaves, and, what is more than the rest, that singular irritability of their surfaces by which they close at a touch, all bear a contributory part in producing an effect connected either with the defense or with the nutrition of the plant. End of section 21. Section 22 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. The Elements. When we come to the elements, we take leave of our mechanics, because we come to those things of the organization of which, if they be organized, we are confessedly ignorant. This ignorance is implied by their name. To say the truth, our investigations are stopped long before we arrive at this point. 
but then it is for our comfort to find that a knowledge of the constitution of the elements is not necessary for us. For instance, as Addison has well observed, quote, we know water sufficiently when we know how to boil, how to freeze, how to evaporate, how to make it fresh, how to make it run or spout out, in what quantity and direction we please, without knowing what water is. Close quote. The observation of this excellent writer has more propriety in it now than it had at the time it was made. For the constitution and the constituent parts of water appear in some measure to have been lately discovered. Yet it does not, I think, appear that we can make any better or greater use of water since the discovery than we did before it. We can never think of the elements without reflecting upon the number of distinct uses which are consolidated in the same substance. The air supplies the lungs, supports fire, conveys sound, reflects light, diffuses smells, gives rain, wafts ships, bears up birds. Ex hudatos tapanta. Water, besides maintaining its own inhabitants, is the universal nourisher of plants and through them of terrestrial animals, is the basis of their juices and fluids, dilutes their food, quenches their thirst, floats their burthens. Fire warms, dissolves, enlightens. It is the great promoter of vegetation and life, if not necessary to the support of both. We might enlarge, to almost any length we pleased, upon each of these uses, but it appears to me almost sufficient to state them. The few remarks which I judge it necessary to add are as follow. 1. Air is essentially different from earth. There appears to be no necessity for an atmosphere's investing our globe yet it does invest it, and we see how many, how various, and how important are the purposes which it answers to every order of animated, not to say of organized, beings which are placed upon the terrestrial surface. I think that every one of these uses will be understood upon the first mention of them, except it be that of reflecting light, which may be explained thus. If I had the power of seeing only by means of rays coming directly from the sun, Whenever I turned my back upon the luminary, I should find myself in darkness. If I had the power of seeing by reflected light, yet by means only of light reflected from solid masses, these masses would shine, indeed, and glisten, but it would be in the dark. The hemisphere, the sky, the world, could only be illuminated, as it is illuminated, by the light of the sun being from all sides and in every direction reflected to the eye by particles as numerous, as thickly scattered, and as widely diffused as are those of the air. Another general quality of the atmosphere is the power of evaporating fluids. The adjustment of this quality to our use is seen in its action upon the sea. In the sea, water and salt are mixed together most intimately, yet the atmosphere raises the water and leaves the salt. Pure and fresh as drops of rain descend, they are collected from brine. If evaporation be solution, which seems to be probable, then the air dissolves the water and not the salt. Upon whatever it be founded, the distinction is critical. So much so that, when we attempt to imitate the process by art, we must regulate our distillation with great care and nicety, or, together with the water, we get the bitterness, or at least the distastefulness, of the marine substance. And, after all, it is owing to this original elective power in the air that we can effect the separation which we wish, by any art or means whatever. By evaporation, water is carried up into the air. By the converse of evaporation, it falls down upon the earth. And how does it fall? Not by the clouds being all at once reconverted into water and descending like a sheet, not in rushing down in columns from a spout, but in moderate drops as from a colander. Our watering pots are made to imitate showers of rain. Yet, a priori, I should have thought either of the two former methods more likely to have taken place than the last. By respiration, flame, putrefaction, air is rendered unfit for the support of animal life. By the constant operation of these corrupting principles, the whole atmosphere, if there were no restoring causes, would come at length to be deprived of its necessary degree of purity. Some of these causes seem to have been discovered, and their efficacy ascertained by experiment and so far as the discovery has proceeded, it opens to us a beautiful and wonderful economy. Vegetation proves to be one of them. A sprig of mint, corked up with a small portion of foul air, placed in the light, renders it again capable of supporting life or flame. 
Here, therefore, is a constant circulation of benefits maintained between the two great provinces of organized nature. The plant purifies what the animal had poisoned. In return, the contaminated air is more than ordinarily nutritious to the plant. Agitation with water turns out to be another of these restoratives. The foulest air, shaken in a bottle with water for a sufficient length of time, recovers a great degree of its purity. Here then, again, allowing for the scale upon which nature works, we see the salutary effects of storms and tempests. The yesty waves, which confound the heaven and the sea, are doing the very thing which was done in the bottle. Nothing can be of greater importance to the living creation than the salubrity of their atmosphere. It ought to reconcile us, therefore, to these agitations of the elements, of which we sometimes deplore the consequences, to know that they tend powerfully to restore to the air that purity which so many causes are constantly impairing. 2. In water, what ought not a little to be admired, are those negative qualities which constitute its purity. Had it been venous or oleaginous or acid, had the sea been filled or the rivers flowed with wine or milk, fish, constituted as they are, must have died. Plants, constituted as they are, would have withered. The lives of animals which feed upon plants must have perished. Its very insipidity, which is one of those negative qualities, renders it the best of all menstrua. Having no taste of its own, it becomes the sincere vehicle of every other. Had there been a taste in water, be it what it might, it would have infected everything we ate or drank with an importunate repetition of the same flavor. Another thing in this element, not less to be admired, is the constant round which it travels, and by which, without suffering either adulteration or waste, it is continually offering itself to the wants of the habitable globe. From the sea are exhaled those vapors which form the clouds. These clouds descend in showers, which, penetrating into the crevices of the hills, supply springs, which springs flow in little streams into the valleys, and, there uniting, become rivers, which rivers in return feed the ocean. So there is an incessant circulation of the same fluid, and not one drop probably more or less now than there was at the creation. A particle of water takes its departure from the surface of the sea in order to fulfill certain important offices to the earth, and, having executed the service which was assigned to it, returns to the bosom which it left. Some have thought that we have too much water upon the globe, the sea occupying above three-quarters of its whole surface. But the expanse of ocean, immense as it is, may be no more than sufficient to fertilize the earth. Or, independently of this reason, I know not why the sea may not have as good a right to its place as the land. It may proportionably support as many inhabitants, minister to as large an aggregate of enjoyment. The land only affords a habitable surface. The sea is habitable to a great depth. 3. Of fire we have said that it dissolves. The only idea probably which this term raised in the reader's mind was that of fire melting metals, resins, and some other substances, fluxing ores, running glass, and assisting us in many of our operations, chemical or culinary. Now these are only uses of an occasional kind, and give us a very imperfect notion of what fire does for us. The grand importance of this dissolving power, the great office indeed of fire in the economy of nature, is keeping things in a state of solution, that is to say, in a state of fluidity. Were it not for the presence of heat, or of a certain degree of it, all fluids would be frozen. The ocean itself would be a quarry of ice, universal nature stiff and dead. We see, therefore, that the elements bear not only a strict relation to the constitution of organized bodies, but a relation to each other. Water could not perform its office to the earth without air, nor exist as water without fire. 4. Of light, whether we regard it as of the same substance with fire or as a different substance, it is altogether superfluous to expatiate upon the use. No man disputes it. The observations, therefore, which I shall offer, respect that little which we seem to know of its constitution. Light travels from the sun at the rate of twelve millions of miles in a minute. Urged by such a velocity, with what force must its particles drive against, I will not say the eye, the tenderest of animal substances, but every substance, animate or inanimate, which stands in its way. It might seem to be a force sufficient to shatter to atoms the hardest bodies. How then is this effect, the consequence of such prodigious velocity, guarded against? 
by a proportionable minuteness of the particles of which light is composed. It is impossible for the human mind to imagine to itself anything so small as a particle of light. But this extreme exility, though difficult to conceive, it is easy to prove. A drop of tallow, expended in the wick of a farthing candle, shall send forth rays sufficient to fill a hemisphere of a mile diameter, and to fill it so full of these rays, that an aperture not larger than the pupil of an eye, wherever it be placed within the hemisphere, shall be sure to receive some of them. What floods of light are continually poured from the sun we cannot estimate, but the immensity of the sphere which is filled with its particles, even if it reached no farther than the orbit of the earth, we can in some sort compute and we have reason to believe that, throughout this whole region, the particles of light lie, in latitude at least, near to one another. The spicitude of the sun's rays at the earth is such that the number which falls upon a burning glass of an inch diameter is sufficient, when concentrated, to set wood on fire. The tenuity and the velocity of particles of light, as ascertained by separate observations, may be said to be proportioned to each other both surpassing our utmost stretch of comprehension, but proportioned. And it is this proportion alone which converts a tremendous element into a welcome visitor. It has been observed to me by a learned friend, as having often struck his mind, that if light had been made by a common artist, it would have been of one uniform color. Whereas, by its present composition, we have that variety of colors which is of such infinite use to us for the distinguishing of objects, which adds so much to the beauty of the earth and augments the stock of our innocent pleasures. With which may be joined another reflection, viz., that considering light as compounded of rays of seven different colors, of which there can be no doubt, because it can be resolved into these rays by simply passing it through a prism, the constituent parts must be well mixed and blended together to produce a fluid so clear and colorless as a beam of light is when received from the sun. End of section 22. Section 23 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. Astronomy. Part 1. My opinion of astronomy has always been that it is not the best medium through which to prove the agency of an intelligent creator, but that, this being proved, it shows beyond all other sciences the magnificence of his operations. The mind which is once convinced, it raises to sublimer views of the deity than any other subject affords. But it is not so well adapted, as some other subjects are, to the purpose of argument. We are destitute of the means of examining the constitution of the heavenly bodies. The very simplicity of their appearance is against them. We see nothing but bright points, luminous circles, or the phases of spheres reflecting the light which falls upon them. Now we deduce design from relation, aptitude, and correspondence of parts. Some degree, therefore, of complexity is necessary to render a subject fit for this species of argument. But the heavenly bodies do not, except perhaps in the instance of Saturn's ring, present themselves to our observation as compounded of parts at all. This, which may be a perfection in them, is a disadvantage to us as inquirers after their nature. They do not come within our mechanics and what we say of their forms is true of their motions. Their motions are carried on without any sensible intermediate apparatus, whereby we are cut off from one principal ground of argumentation, analogy. We have nothing wherewith to compare them, no invention, no discovery, no operation or resource of art, which, in this respect, resembles them. Even those things which are made to imitate and represent them, such as orreries, planetaria, celestial globes, etc., bear no affinity to them in the cause and principle by which their motions are actuated. I can assign for this difference a reason of utility, viz., a reason why, though the action of terrestrial bodies upon each other be, in almost all cases, through the intervention of solid or fluid substances, yet central attraction does not operate in this manner. It was necessary that the intervals between the planetary orbs should be devoid of any inert matter, either fluid or solid, because such an intervening substance would, by its resistance, destroy those very motions which attraction is employed to preserve. This may be a final cause of the difference, but still the difference destroys the analogy. Our ignorance, moreover, of the sensitive natures by which other planets are inhabited, 
necessarily keeps from us the knowledge of numberless utilities, relations, and subserviencies which we perceive upon our own globe. After all, the real subject of admiration is that we understand so much of astronomy as we do, that an animal confined to the surface of one of the planets, bearing a less proportion to it than the smallest microscopic insect does to the plant it lives upon, that this little busy, inquisitive creature, by the use of senses which were given to it for its domestic necessities, and by means of the assistance of those senses which it has had the art to procure, should have been enabled to observe the whole system of worlds to which its own belongs, the changes of place of the immense globes which compose it, and with such accuracy as to mark out beforehand the situation in the heavens in which they will be found at any future point of time, and that these bodies, after sailing through regions of void and trackless space, should arrive at the place where they were expected, not within a minute, but within a few seconds of a minute, of the time prefixed and predicted, all this is wonderful, whether we refer our admiration to the constancy of the heavenly motions themselves, or to the perspicacity and precision with which they have been noticed by mankind. Nor is this the whole, nor indeed the chief part, of what astronomy teaches. By bringing reason to bear upon observation, the acutest reasoning upon the exactest observation, the astronomer has been able, out of the mystic dance and the confusion, for such it is, under which the motions of the heavenly bodies present themselves to the eye of a mere gazer upon the skies, to elicit their order and their real paths. Our knowledge, therefore, of astronomy is admirable, though imperfect, and, amidst the confessed desiderata and desideranda, which impede our investigation of the wisdom of the deity in these the grandest of his works, there are to be found in the phenomena ascertain circumstances and laws sufficient to indicate an intellectual agency in three of its principal operations, viz., in choosing, in determining, in regulating. In choosing, out of a boundless variety of suppositions which were equally possible, that which is beneficial, in determining what, left to itself, had a thousand chances against conveniency for one in its favor, in regulating subjects, as to quantity and degree, which, by their nature, were unlimited with respect to either. It will be our business to offer, under each of these heads, a few instances such as best admit of a popular explication. 1. Amongst proofs of choice, one is fixing the source of light and heat in the center of the system. The sun is ignited and luminous, the planets which move round him cold and dark. There seems to be no antecedent necessity for this order. The sun might have been an opaque mass, some one or two or more or any or all the planets globes of fire. There is nothing in the nature of the heavenly bodies which requires that those which are stationary should be on fire, that those which move should be cold. For, in fact, comets are bodies on fire, or at least capable of the most intense heat, yet revolve round a center. Nor does this order obtain between the primary planets and their secondaries, which are all opaque. When we consider, therefore, that the sun is one, that the planets going round it are at least seven, that it is indifferent to their nature, which are luminous and which are opaque, and also in what order, with respect to each other, these two kinds of bodies are disposed, we may judge of the improbability of the present arrangement taking place by chance. If, by way of accounting for the state in which we find the solar system, it be alleged, and this is one amongst the guesses of those who reject an intelligent creator, that the planets themselves are only cooled or cooling masses, and were once, like the sun, many thousand times hotter than red-hot iron, then it follows that the sun also himself must be in his progress toward growing cold, which puts an end to the possibility of his having existed, as he is, from eternity. This consequence arises out of the hypothesis with still more certainty, if we make a part of it what the philosophers who maintain it have usually taught, that the planets were originally masses of matter struck off in a state of fusion from the body of the sun by the percussion of a comet, or by a shock from some other cause with which we are not acquainted. For if these masses, partaking of the nature and substance of the sun's body, have in process of time lost their heat, that body itself, in time likewise, no matter in how much longer time, must lose its heat also, and therefore be incapable of an eternal duration in the state in which we see it, either for the time to come or the time past. The preference of the present to any other mode of distributing luminous and opaque bodies I take to be evident. It requires more astronomy than I am able to lay before the reader 
to show in its particulars what would be the effect to the system of a dark body at the center and of one of the planets being luminous. But I think it manifests, without either plates or calculation, first, that supposing the necessary proportion of magnitude between the central and the revolving bodies to be preserved, the ignited planet would not be sufficient to illuminate and warm the rest of the system. Secondly, that its light and heat would be imparted to the other planets much more irregularly than light and heat are now received from the sun. 2. Another thing in which a choice appears to be exercised, and in which, amongst the possibilities out of which the choice was to be made, the number of those which were wrong bore an infinite proportion to the number of those which were right, is in what geometricians call the axis of rotation. This matter I will endeavor to explain. The earth, it is well known, is not an exact globe, but an oblate spheroid, something like an orange. Now the axes of rotation, or the diameters upon which such a body may be made to turn round, are as many as can be drawn through its center to opposite points upon its whole surface. But of these axes, none are permanent except either its shortest diameter, i.e. that which passes through the heart of the orange from the place where the stalk is inserted into it, and which is but one, or its longest diameters, at right angles with the former, which must all terminate in the single circumference which goes round the thickest part of the orange. The shortest diameter is that upon which, in fact, the earth turns. And it is, as the reader sees, what it ought to be, a permanent axis. Whereas, had blind chance, had a casual impulse, had a stroke or push at random, set the earth a-spinning, the odds were infinite but that they had sent it round upon a wrong axis. And what would have been the consequence? The difference between a permanent axis and another axis is this. When a spheroid in a state of rotatory motion gets upon a permanent axis, it keeps there. It remains steady and faithful to its position. Its poles preserve their direction with respect to the plane and to the center of its orbit. But whilst it turns upon an axis which is not permanent, and the number of those we have seen infinitely exceeds the number of the other, it is always liable to shift and vacillate from one axis to another, with a corresponding change in the inclination of its poles. Therefore, if a planet once set off revolving upon any other than its shortest, or one of its longest, axes, the poles on its surface would keep perpetually changing, and it never would attain a permanent axis of rotation. The effect of this unfixedness and instability would be that the equatorial parts of the Earth might become the polar, or the polar the equatorial, to the utter destruction of plants and animals which are not capable of interchanging their situations, but are respectively adapted to their own. As to ourselves, instead of rejoicing in our temperate zone, and annually preparing for the moderate vicissitude, or rather the agreeable succession, of seasons, which we experience and expect, we might come to be locked up in the ice and darkness of the Arctic Circle, with bodies neither inured to its rigors, nor provided with shelter or defense against them. Nor would it be much better if the trepidation of our pole, taking an opposite course, should place us under the heats of a vertical sun. But if it would fare so ill with the human inhabitant, who can live under greater varieties of latitude than any other animal, still more noxious would this translation of climate have proved to life in the rest of the creation, and, most perhaps of all, in plants. The habitable earth, and its beautiful variety, might have been destroyed by a simple mischance in the axis of rotation. 3. All this, however, proceeds upon a supposition of the earth having been formed at first an oblate spheroid. There is another supposition, and perhaps our limited information will not enable us to decide between them. The second supposition is that the earth, being a mixed mass, somewhat fluid, took, as it might do, its present form by the joint action of the mutual gravitation of its parts and its rotatory motion. This, as we have said, is a point in the history of the earth which our observations are not sufficient to determine. For a very small depth below the surface, but extremely small, less perhaps than an eight thousandth part compared with the depth of the center, we find vestiges of ancient fluidity. But this fluidity must have gone down many hundred times farther than we can penetrate, to enable the earth to take its present oblate form. And whether any traces of this kind exist to that depth, we are ignorant. Calculations were made a few years ago of the mean density of the earth by comparing the force of its attraction with the force of attraction of a rock of granite, the bulk of which could be ascertained. And the upshot of the calculation was that the earth, upon an average, through its whole sphere, 
has twice the density of granite, or about five times that of water. Therefore it cannot be a hollow shell, as some have formerly supposed, nor can its internal parts be occupied by central fire or by water. The solid parts must greatly exceed the fluid parts, and the probability is that it is a solid mass throughout, composed of substances more ponderous the deeper we go. Nevertheless, we may conceive the present face of the earth to have originated from the revolution of a sphere covered by a surface of a compound mixture, the fluid and solid parts separating as the surface becomes quiescent. Here then comes in the moderating hand of the Creator. If the water had exceeded its present proportion, even but by a trifling quantity compared with the whole globe, all the land would have been covered. Had there been much less than there is, there would not have been enough to fertilize the continent. Had the exsiccation been progressive, such as we may suppose to have been produced by an evaporating heat, how came it to stop at the point at which we see it? Why did it not stop sooner? Why at all? The mandate of the deity will account for this, nothing else will. 4. Of Centripetal Forces By virtue of the simplest law that can be imagined, viz., that a body continues in the state in which it is, whether of motion or rest, and, if in motion, goes on in the line in which it was proceeding, and with the same velocity, unless there be some cause for change, by virtue, I say, of this law, it comes to pass, what may appear to be a strange consequence, that cases arise in which attraction, incessantly drawing a body towards a center, never brings, nor ever will bring, the body to that center, but keep it in eternal circulation round it. If it were possible to fire off a cannonball with the velocity of five miles in a second, and the resistance of the air could be taken away, the cannonball would forever wheel round the earth instead of falling down upon it. This is the principle which sustains the heavenly motions. The deity, having appointed this law to matter, than which, as we have said before, no law could be more simple, has turned it to a wonderful account in constructing planetary systems. The actuating cause in these systems is an attraction which varies reciprocally as the square of the distance, that is, at double the distance has a quarter of the force, at half the distance four times the strength, and so on. Now, concerning this law of variation, we have three things to observe. First, that attraction, for anything we know about it, was just as capable of one law of variation as of another. Secondly, that, out of an infinite number of possible laws, those which were admissible for the purpose of supporting the heavenly motions lay within certain narrow limits. Thirdly, that of the admissible laws, or those which come within the limits prescribed, the law that actually prevails is the most beneficial. So far as these propositions can be made out, we may be said, I think, to prove choice and regulation. Choice, out of boundless variety, and regulation, of that which by its own nature was, in respect of the property regulated, indifferent and indefinite. 1. First, then, attraction, for anything we know about it, was originally indifferent to all laws of variation depending upon change of distance, i.e., just as susceptible of one law as of another. It might have been the same at all distances, it might have increased as the distance increased, or it might have diminished with the increase of the distance. Yet in ten thousand different proportions from the present, it might have followed no stated law at all. If attraction be, what Coates, with many other Newtonians, thought it to be, a primordial property of matter, not dependent upon or traceable to any other material cause, then, by the very nature and definition of a primordial property, it stood indifferent to all laws. If it be the agency of something immaterial, then also, for anything we know of it, it was indifferent to all laws. If the revolution of bodies round a center depend upon vortices, neither are these limited to one law more than another. There is, I know, an account given of attraction which should seem, in its very cause, to assign to it the law which we find it to observe, and which, therefore, makes that law a law not of choice but of necessity. And it is the account which ascribes attraction to an emanation from the attracting body. It is probable that the influence of such an emanation will be proportioned to the spicitude of the rays of which it is composed, which spicitude, supposing the rays to issue in right lines on all sides from a point, will be reciprocally as the square of the distance. The mathematics of this solution we do not call in question. The question with us is whether there be any sufficient reason for believing that attraction is produced by an emanation. 
For my part, I am totally at a loss to comprehend how particles streaming from a center should draw a body towards it. The impulse, if impulse it be, is all the other way. Nor shall we find less difficulty in conceiving a conflux of particles, incessantly flowing to a center, and carrying down all bodies along with it, that center also itself being in a state of rapid motion through absolute space. For by what source is the stream fed, or what becomes of the accumulation? Add to which that it seems to imply a contrariety of properties to suppose an ethereal fluid to act, but not to resist. Powerful enough to carry down bodies with great force towards a center, yet inconsistently with the nature of inert matter, powerless and perfectly yielding with respect to the motions which result from the projectile impulse. By calculations drawn from ancient notices of eclipses of the moon, we can prove that, if such a fluid exist at all, its resistance has had no sensible effect upon the moon's motion for 2,500 years. The truth is that, except this one circumstance of the variation of the attracting force at different distances agreeing with the variation of the spicitude, there is no reason whatever to support the hypothesis of an emanation, and, as it seems to me, almost insuperable reasons against it. End of section 23「ニャチュラル・テオロジー」by William Paley。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Astronomy Part 2 2. Our second proposition is that whilst the possible laws of variation were infinite, the admissible laws, or the laws compatible with the preservation of the system, lie within narrow limits. If the attracting force had varied according to any direct law of the distance, let it have been what it would, great destruction and confusion would have taken place. The direct, simple proportion of the distance would, it is true, have produced an ellipse, but the perturbing forces would have acted with so much advantage as to be continually changing the dimensions of the ellipse in a manner inconsistent with our terrestrial creation. For instance, if the planet Saturn, so large and so remote, had attracted the Earth, both in proportion to the quantity of matter contained in it, which it does, and also in any proportion to its distance, i.e., if it had pulled the harder for being the further off, instead of the reverse of it, it would have dragged out of its course the globe which we inhabit, and have perplexed its motions to a degree incompatible with our security, our enjoyments, and probably our existence. Of the inverse laws, if the centripetal force had changed as the cube of the distance, or in any higher proportion, that is, for I speak to the unlearned, if at double the distance the attractive force had been diminished to an eighth part, or to less than that, the consequence would have been that the planets, if they once began to approach the sun, would have fallen into his body. If they once, though by ever so little, increased their distance from the center, would forever have receded from it. The laws, therefore, of attraction, by which a system of revolving bodies could be upholden in their motions, lie within narrow limits compared with the possible laws. I much underrate the restriction when I say that in a scale of a mile they are confined to an inch. All direct ratios of the distance are excluded on account of danger from perturbing forces. All reciprocal ratios, except what lie beneath the cube of the distance, by the demonstrable consequence that every the least change of distance would, under the operation of such laws, have been fatal to the repose and order of the system. We do not know, that is, we seldom reflect, how interested we are in this matter. Small irregularities may be endured, but changes within these limits being allowed for, the permanency of our ellipse is a question of life and death to our whole sensitive world. 3. That the subsisting law of attraction falls within the limits which utility requires, when these limits bear so small a proportion to the range of possibilities upon which chance might equally have cast it, is not, with any appearance of reason, to be accounted for by any other cause than a regulation proceeding from a designing mind. But our next proposition carries the matter somewhat further. We say, in the third place, that out of the different laws which lie within the limits of admissible laws, the best is made choice of, that there are advantages in this particular law which cannot be demonstrated to belong to any other law, and concerning some of which it can be demonstrated that they do not belong to any other. 1. Whilst this law prevails between each particle of matter, the united attraction of a sphere, 
composed of that matter, observes the same law. This property of the law is necessary to render it applicable to a system composed of spheres, but it is a property which belongs to no other law of attraction that is admissible. The law of variation of the united attraction is in no other case the same as the law of attraction of each particle, one case excepted, and that is, of the attraction varying directly as the distance, the inconveniency of which law in other respects we have already noticed. We may follow this regulation somewhat further, and still more strikingly perceive that it proceeded from a designing mind. A law, both admissible and convenient, was requisite. In what way is the law of the attracting globes obtained? Astronomical observations and terrestrial experiments show that the attraction of the globes of the system is made up of the attraction of their parts, the attraction of each globe being compounded of the attractions of its parts. Now the admissible and convenient law which exists could not be obtained in a system of bodies gravitating by the united gravitation of their parts unless each particle of matter were attracted by a force varying by one particular law, viz. varying inversely as the square of the distance. For if the action of the particles be according to any other law whatever, the admissible and convenient law which is adopted could not be obtained. Here then are clearly shown regulation and design. A law both admissible and convenient was to be obtained. The mode chosen for obtaining that law was by making each particle of matter act. After this choice was made, then further attention was to be given to each particle of matter and one and one only particular law of action to be assigned to it no other law would have answered the purpose intended. 2. All systems must be liable to perturbations, and therefore to guard against these perturbations, or rather to guard against their running to destructive lengths, is perhaps the strongest evidence of care and foresight that can be given. Now we are able to demonstrate of our law of attraction what can be demonstrated of no other, and what qualifies the dangers which arise from cross but unavoidable influences, that the action of the parts of our system upon one another will not cause permanently increasing irregularities, but merely periodical or vibratory ones. That is, they will come to a limit and then go back again. This we can demonstrate only of a system in which the following properties concur, viz. that the force shall be inversely as the square of the distance, the masses of the revolving bodies small compared with that of the body at the center, the orbits not much inclined to one another, and their eccentricity little. In such a system the grand points are secure. The mean distances and periodic times upon which depend our temperature and the regularity of our year are constant. The eccentricities, it is true, will still vary, but so slowly and to so small an extent as to produce no inconveniency from fluctuation of temperature and season. The same as to the obliquity of the planes of the orbits. For instance, the inclination of the ecliptic to the equator will never change above two degrees out of ninety, and that will require many thousand years in performing. It has been rightly also remarked that if the great planets, Jupiter and Saturn, had moved in lower spheres, their influences would have had much more effect as to disturbing the planetary motions than they now have. While they revolve at so great distances from the rest, they act almost equally on the sun and on the inferior planets, which has nearly the same consequence as not acting at all upon either. If it be said that the planets might have been sent round the sun in exact circles, in which case no change of distance from the center taking place, the law of variation of the attracting power would have never come in question. One law would have served as well as another. An answer to the scheme may be drawn from the consideration of these same perturbing forces. The system retaining in other respects its present constitution Though the planets had been at first sent round in exact circular orbits, they could not have kept them, and if the law of attraction had not been what it is, or at least if the prevailing law had transgressed the limits above assigned, every evagation would have been fatal. The planet, once drawn, as drawn it necessarily must have been, out of its course, would have wandered in endless error. 5. What we have seen in the law of the centripetal force, viz., a choice guided by views of utility, and a choice of one law out of thousands which might equally have taken place, we see no less in the figures of the planetary orbits. It was not enough to fix the law of the centripetal force, though by the wisest choice, for even under that law it was still competent to the planets to have moved in paths possessing so great a degree of eccentricity as, in the course of every revolution, 
to be brought very near to the sun and carried away to immense distances from him. The comets actually move in orbits of this sort, and had the planets done so, instead of going round in orbits nearly circular, the change from one extremity of temperature to another must, in hours at least, have destroyed every animal and plant upon its surface. Now, the distance from the center at which a planet sets off, and the absolute force of attraction at that distance, being fixed, the figure of its orbit, its being a circle, or nearer to, or further off from a circle, viz. a rounder or a longer oval, depends upon two things, the velocity with which, and the direction in which, the planet is projected. And these, in order to produce a right result, must be both brought within certain narrow limits. One and only one velocity, united with one and only one direction, will produce a perfect circle. And the velocity must be near to this velocity, and the direction also near to this direction, to produce orbits such as the planetary orbits are, nearly circular, that is, ellipses with small eccentricities. The velocity and the direction must both be right. If the velocity be wrong, no direction will cure the error. If the direction be in any considerable degree oblique, no velocity will produce the orbit required. Take, for example, the attraction of gravity at the surface of the Earth. The force of that attraction being what it is, out of all the degrees of velocity, swift and slow, with which a ball might be shot off, none would answer the purpose of which we are speaking but what was nearly that of five miles in a second. If it were less than that, the body would not get round at all, but would come to the ground. If it were in any considerable degree more than that, the body would take one of those eccentric courses, those long ellipses, of which we have noticed the inconveniency. If the velocity reached the rate of seven miles in a second, or went beyond that, the ball would fly off from the earth and never be heard of more. In like manner, with respect to the direction, out of the innumerable angles in which the ball might be sent off, I mean angles formed with a line drawn to the center, none would serve but what was nearly a right one. Out of the various directions in which the cannon might be pointed, upwards and downwards, every one would fail but what was exactly or nearly horizontal. The same thing holds true of the planets, of our own amongst the rest. We are entitled, therefore, to ask, and to urge the question, why did the projectile velocity and projectile direction of the earth happen to be nearly those which would retain it in a circular form? Why not one of the infinite numbers of velocities, one of the infinite number of directions, which would have made it approach much nearer to, or recede much further from, the sun? The planets going round, all in the same direction, and all nearly in the same plane, afforded to Buffon a ground for asserting that they had all been shivered from the sun by the same stroke of a comet, and by that stroke projected into their present orbits. Now, beside that this is to attribute to chance the fortunate concurrence of velocity and direction which we have been here noticing, the hypothesis, as I apprehend, is inconsistent with the physical laws by which the heavenly motions are governed. If the planets were struck off from the surface of the sun, they would return to the surface of the sun again. Nor will this difficulty be got rid of by supposing that the same violent blow which shattered the sun's surface and separated large fragments from it pushed the sun himself out of his place, for the consequence of this would be that the sun and system of shattered fragments would have a progressive motion, which, indeed, may possibly be the case with our system, but then each fragment would, in every revolution, return to the surface of the sun again. The hypothesis is also contradicted by the vast difference which subsists between the diameters of the planetary orbits. The distance of Saturn from the sun, to say nothing of the Georgium Sidus, is nearly five and twenty times that of Mercury a disparity which it seems impossible to reconcile with Buffon's scheme. Bodies starting from the same place, with whatever difference of direction or velocity they set off, could not have been found at these different distances from the center, still retaining their nearly circular orbits. They must have been carried to their proper distances before they were projected. Footnote. Quote, if we suppose the matter of the system to be accumulated in the center by its gravity, no mechanical principles, with the assistance of this power of gravity, could separate the vast mass into such parts as the sun and planets, and, after carrying them to their different distances, project them in their several directions, preserving still the equality of action and reaction, or the state of the center of gravity of the system. Such an exquisite structure of things could only arise from the contrivance and powerful influences of an intelligent, free, and most potent agent. The same powers, therefore, which, at present, govern the material universe, and conduct its various motions, 
are very different from those which were necessary to have produced it from nothing, or to have disposed it in the admirable form in which it now proceeds. Close quote. McLaren's Account of Newton's Philosophy, page 407, edition 3. End of footnote. To conclude, in astronomy, the great thing is to raise the imagination to the subject, and that oftentimes in opposition to the impression made upon the senses. An illusion, for example, must be gotten over, arising from the distance at which we view the heavenly bodies, viz. the apparent slowness of their motions. The moon shall take some hours in getting half a yard from a star which it touched. A motion so deliberate we may think easily guided. But what is the fact? The moon, in fact, is, all this while, driving through the heavens at the rate of considerably more than two thousand miles in an hour, which is more than double of that with which a ball is shot off from the mouth of a cannon. Yet is this prodigious rapidity as much under government as if the planet proceeded ever so slowly or were conducted in its course inch by inch. It is also difficult to bring the imagination to conceive, what yet to judge tolerably of the matter it is necessary to conceive, how loose, if we may so express it, the heavenly bodies are. Enormous globes, held by nothing, confined by nothing, are turned into free and boundless space, each to seek its course by the virtue of an invisible principle, but a principle, one, common, and the same in all, and ascertainable. To preserve such bodies from being lost, from running together in heaps, from hindering and distracting one another's motions, in a degree inconsistent with any continuing order, i.e., to cause them to form planetary systems, systems that, when formed, can be upheld, and, most especially, systems accommodated to the organized and sensitive natures which the planets sustain, as we know to be the case, where alone we can know what the case is upon our earth. All this requires an intelligent interposition, because it can be demonstrated concerning it that it requires an adjustment of force, distance, direction, and velocity out of the reach of chance to have produced, an adjustment in its view to utility similar to that which we see in ten thousand subjects of nature which are nearer to us, but in power, and in the extent of space through which that power is exerted, stupendous. But many of the heavenly bodies, as the sun and fixed stars, are stationary. Their rest must be the effect of an absence or of an equilibrium of attractions. It proves also that a projectile impulse was originally given to some of the heavenly bodies and not to others. But further, if attraction act at all distances, there can be only one quiescent center of gravity in the universe, and all bodies whatever must be approaching this center or revolving around it. According to the first of these suppositions, if the duration of the world had been long enough to allow of it, all its parts, all the great bodies of which it is composed, must have been gathered together in a heap round this point. No changes, however, which have been observed, afford us the smallest reason for believing that either the one supposition or the other is true, and then it will follow that attraction itself is controlled or suspended by a superior agent, that there is a power above the highest of the powers of material nature, a will which restrains and circumscribes the operations of the most extensive. Footnote. It must here, however, be stated that many astronomers deny that any of the heavenly bodies are absolutely stationary. Some of the brightest of the fixed stars have certainly small motions, and of the rest the distance is too great and the intervals of our observation too short to enable us to pronounce with certainty that they may not have the same. The motions in the fixed stars which have been observed are considered either as proper to each of them or as compounded of the motion of our system and of motions proper to each star. By a comparison of these motions, a motion in our system is supposed to be discovered. By continuing this analogy to other, and to all systems, it is possible to suppose that attraction is unlimited, and that the whole material universe is revolving round some fixed point within its containing sphere of space. End of section 24。section 25 of Natural Theology by William Paley。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 23 of the Personality of the Deity, Part 1. Contrivance, if established, appears to me to prove everything which we wish to prove. Among other things, it proves the personality of the Deity, as distinguished from what is sometimes called nature, sometimes called a principle, which terms, in the mouths of those who use them philosophically, 
seem to be intended to admit and to express an efficacy, but to exclude and deny a personal agent. Now that which can contrive, which can design, must be a person. These capacities constitute personality, for they imply consciousness and thought. They require that which can perceive an end or purpose, as well as the power of providing means and of directing them to their end. They require a center in which perceptions unite and from which volitions flow, which is mind. The acts of a mind prove the existence of a mind, and in whatever a mind resides is a person. The seat of intellect is a person. We have no authority to limit the properties of mind to any particular corporeal form or to any particular circumscription of space. These properties subsist in created nature under a great variety of sensible forms. Also, every animated being has its sensorium, that is, a certain portion of space within which perception and volition are exerted. This sphere may be enlarged to an indefinite extent, may comprehend the universe, and being so imagined, may serve to furnish us with as good a notion as we are capable of forming of the immensity of the divine nature, i.e. of a being, infinite as well in essence as in power, yet nevertheless a person. No man hath seen God at any time. And this, I believe, makes the great difficulty. Now it is a difficulty which chiefly arises from our not duly estimating the state of our faculties. The deity, it is true, is the object of none of our senses, but reflect what limited capacities animal senses are. Many animals seem to have but one sense, or perhaps two at the most, touch and taste. Ought such an animal to conclude against the existence of odors, sounds, and colors? To another species is given the sense of smelling. This is an advance in the knowledge of the powers and properties of nature. But if this favored animal should infer, from its superiority over the class last described, that it perceived everything which was perceptible in nature, it is known to us, though perhaps not suspected by the animal itself, that it proceeded upon a false and presumptuous estimate of its faculties. To another is added the sense of hearing, which lets in a class of sensations entirely unconceived by the animal before spoken of, not only distinct, but remote from any which it had ever experienced, and greatly superior to them. Yet this last animal has no more ground for believing that its senses comprehend all things and all properties of things which exist than might have been claimed by the tribes of animals beneath it. For we know that it is still possible to possess another sense, that of sight, which shall disclose to the percipient a new world. This fifth sense makes the animal what the human animal is. But to infer that possibility stops here, that either this fifth sense is the last sense, or that the five comprehend all existence, is just as unwarrantable a conclusion as that which might have been made by any of the different species which possessed fewer, or even by that, if such there be, which possessed only one. The conclusion of the one sense animal and the conclusion of the five sense animal stand upon the same authority. There may be more and other senses than those which we have. There may be senses suited to the perception of the powers, properties, and substance of spirits. These may belong to higher orders of rational agents, for there is not the smallest reason for supposing that we are the highest, or that the scale of creation stops with us. The great energies of nature are known to us only by their effects. The substances which produce them are as much concealed from our senses as the divine essence itself. Gravitation, though constantly present, though constantly exerting its influence, though everywhere around us, near us, and within us, though diffused throughout all space and penetrating the texture of all bodies with which we are acquainted, depends, if upon a fluid, upon a fluid which, though both powerful and universal in its operation, is no object of sense to us, if upon any other kind of substance or action, upon a substance and action from which we receive no distinguishable impressions. Is it then to be wondered at that it should in some measure be the same with the divine nature? Of this, however, we are certain, that whatever the deity be, neither the universe nor any part of it which we see can be he. The universe itself is merely a collective name. Its parts are all which are real or which are things. Now inert matter is out of the question, and organized substances include marks of contrivance. But whatever includes marks of contrivance, whatever in its constitution testifies design, necessarily carries us to something beyond itself, to a designer prior to and out of itself. No animal, for instance, can have contrived its own limbs and senses, 
can have been the author to itself of the design with which they were constructed. That supposition involves all the absurdity of self-creation, i.e., of acting without existing. Nothing can be God which is ordered by a wisdom and a will which itself is void of, which is indebted for any of its properties to contrivance ab extra. The not having that in his nature which requires the exertion of another prior being, which property is sometimes called self-sufficiency and sometimes self-comprehension, appertains to the deity as his essential distinction and removes his nature from that of all things which we see. Which consideration contains the answer to a question that has sometimes been asked, namely, why, since something or other must have existed from eternity, may not the present universe be that something? The contrivance perceived in it proves that to be impossible. Nothing contrived can, in a strict and proper sense, be eternal, forasmuch as the contriver must have existed before the contrivance. Wherever we see marks of contrivance, we are led for its cause to an intelligent author, and this transition of the understanding is founded upon uniform experience. We see intelligence constantly contriving, that is, we see intelligence constantly producing effects, marked and distinguished by certain properties, not certain particular properties, but by a kind and class of properties, such as relation to an end, relation of parts to one another, and to a common purpose. We see, wherever we are witnesses to the actual formation of things, nothing except intelligence producing effects so marked and distinguished. Furnished with this experience, we view the productions of nature. We observe them also marked and distinguished in the same manner. We wish to account for their origin. Our experience suggests a cause perfectly adequate to this account. No experience, no single instance or example, can be offered in favor of any other. In this cause, therefore, we ought to rest. In this cause, the common sense of mankind has in fact rested, because it agrees with that which, in all causes, is the foundation of knowledge, the undeviating course of their experience. The reasoning is the same as that by which we conclude any ancient appearances to have been the effects of volcanoes or inundations, namely, because they resemble the effects which fire and water produce before our eyes, and because we have never known these effects to result from any other operation and this resemblance may subsist in so many circumstances as not to leave us under the smallest doubt in forming our opinion. Men are not deceived by this reasoning, for whenever it happens, as it sometimes does happen, that the truth comes to be known by direct information, it turns out to be what was expected. In like manner, and upon the same foundation, which in truth is that of experience, we conclude that the works of nature proceed from intelligence and design, because, in the properties of relation to a purpose, subserviency to a use, they resemble what intelligence and design are constantly producing, and what nothing else except intelligence and design ever produce at all. Of every argument which would raise a question as to the safety of this reasoning, it may be observed that, if such argument be listened to, it leads to the inference not only that the present order of nature is insufficient to prove the existence of an intelligent creator, but that no imaginable order would be sufficient to prove it that no contrivance, were it ever so mechanical, ever so precise, ever so clear, ever so perfectly like those which we ourselves employ, would support this conclusion, a doctrine to which I conceive no sound mind can assent. The force, however, of the reasoning is sometimes sunk by our taking up with mere names. We have already noticed, and we must here notice again, the misapplication of the term law, and the mistake concerning the idea which that term expresses in physics whenever such idea is made to take the place of power, and still more of an intelligent power, and, as such, to be assigned for the cause of anything, or of any property of anything, that exists. This is what we are secretly apt to do when we speak of organized bodies, plants, for instance, or animals, owing their production, their form, their growth, their qualities, their beauty, their use, to any law or laws of nature and when we are contented to sit down with that answer to our inquiries concerning them. I say once more that it is a perversion of language to assign any law as the efficient operative cause of anything. A law presupposes an agent, for it is only the mode according to which an agent proceeds. It implies a power, for it is the order according to which that power acts. Without this agent, without this power, which are both distinct from itself, the law does nothing, is nothing. What has been said concerning law holds true of mechanism. Mechanism is not itself power. Mechanism, without power, can do nothing. Let a watch be contrived and constructed ever so ingeniously, 
be its parts ever so many, ever so complicated, ever so finely wrought, or artificially put together, it cannot go without a weight or spring, that is, without a force independent of and ulterior to its mechanism. The spring acting at the center will produce different motions and different results according to the variety of the intermediate mechanism. One and the self-same spring, acting in one and the same manner, viz. by simply expanding itself, may be the cause of a hundred different and all useful movements if a hundred different and well-devised sets of wheels be placed between it and the final effect, e.g., may point out the hour of the day, the day of the month, the age of the moon, the position of the planets, the cycle of the years, and many other serviceable notices. And these movements may fulfill their purposes with more or less perfection, according as the mechanism is better or worse contrived, or better or worse executed, or in a better or worse state of repair. But in all cases it is necessary that the spring act at the center. The course of our reasoning upon such a subject would be this. By inspecting the watch, even when standing still, we get a proof of contrivance, and of a contriving mind, having been employed about it. In the form and obvious relation of its parts, we see enough to convince us of this. If we pull the works in pieces for the purpose of a closer examination, we are still more fully convinced. But, when we see the watch going, we see proof of another point, viz. that there is a power somewhere, and somehow or other, applied to it, a power in action, that there is more in the subject than the mere wheels of the machine, that there is a secret spring or gravitating plummet, in a word, that there is force and energy as well as mechanism. So then, the watch in motion establishes to the observer two conclusions. One, that thought, contrivance, and design have been employed in the forming, proportioning, and arranging of its parts, and that whoever or wherever he be or were, such a contriver there is or was. The other, that force or power, distinct from mechanism, is at this present time acting upon it. If I saw a hand mill, even at rest, I should see contrivance. But if I saw it grinding, I should be assured that a hand was at the windlass, though in another room. It is the same in nature. In the works of nature we trace mechanism, and this alone proves contrivance. But living, active, moving, productive nature proves also the exertion of a power at the center, for wherever the power resides may be denominated the center. The intervention and disposition of what are called second causes fall under the same observation. This disposition is or is not mechanism according as we can or cannot trace it by our senses and means of examination. That is all the difference there is, and it is a difference which respects our faculties, not the things themselves. Now, where the order of second causes is mechanical, what is here said of mechanism strictly applies to it. But it would be always mechanism, natural chemistry, for instance, would be mechanism, if our senses were acute enough to descry it. Neither mechanism, therefore, in the works of nature, nor the intervention of what are called second causes, for I think that they are the same thing, excuses the necessity of an agent distinct from both. If, in tracing these causes, it be said that we find certain general properties of matter which have nothing in them that bespeaks intelligence, I answer that, still, the managing of these properties, the pointing and directing them to the uses which we see made of them, demands intelligence in the highest degree. For example, suppose animal secretions to be elective attractions, and that such and such attractions universally belong to such and such substances in all which there is no intellect concerned. Still, the choice and collocation of these substances, the fixing upon right substances, and disposing them in right places, must be an act of intelligence. What mischief would follow were there a single transposition of the secretory organs, a single mistake in arranging the glands which compose them? There may be many second causes, and many courses of second causes, one behind another, between what we observe of nature and the deity. But there must be intelligence somewhere, there must be more in nature than what we see, and, amongst the things unseen, there must be an intelligent, designing author. The philosopher beholds with astonishment the production of things around him. Unconscious particles of matter take their stations, and severally range themselves in an order, so as to become collectively plants or animals, i.e. organized bodies, with parts bearing strict and evident relation to one another, and to the utility of the whole and it should seem that these particles could not move in any other way than as they do, for they testify not the smallest sign of choice or liberty or discretion. There may be particular intelligent beings guiding these motions in each case, 
or they may be the result of trains of mechanical dispositions fixed beforehand by an intelligent appointment and kept in action by a power at the center. But in either case there must be intelligence. End of section 25「ネチュラル」。A diversified, multifarious, or progressive operation distinguishable into parts. The power in organized bodies, of producing bodies like themselves, is one of these principles. Give a philosopher this and he can get on. But he does not reflect what this mode of production, this principle, if such he choose to call it, requires, how much it presupposes, what an apparatus of instruments, some of which are strictly mechanical, is necessary to its success. What a train it includes of operations and changes, one succeeding another, one related to another, one ministering to another, all advancing by intermediate and, frequently, by sensible steps to their ultimate result. Yet, because the whole of this complicated action is wrapped up in a single term, generation, we are to set it down as an elementary principle, and to suppose that, when we have resolved the things which we see into this principle, We have sufficiently accounted for their origin without the necessity of a designing intelligent creator. The truth is, generation is not a principle but a process. We might as well call the casting of metals a principle. We might, so far as appears to me, as well call spinning and weaving principles, and then, referring the texture of cloths, the fabric of muslins and calicoes, the patterns of diapers and damasks, to these as principles, pretend to dispense with intention, thought, and contrivance on the part of the artist, or to dispense, indeed, with the necessity of any artist at all, either in the manufacturing of the article or in the fabrication of the machinery by which the manufacture was carried on. And, after all, how, or in what sense, is it true that animals produce their like? A butterfly with a proboscis instead of a mouth, with four wings and six legs, produces a hairy caterpillar with jaws and teeth and fourteen feet. A frog produces a tadpole. A black beetle, with gauze wings and a crusty covering, produces a white, smooth, soft worm. An ephemeron fly, a codbait maggot. These, by a progress through different stages of life and action and enjoyment, and in each state provided with implements and organs appropriated to the temporary nature which they bear, arrive at last at the form and fashion of the parent animal. But all this is process, not principle, and proves, moreover, that the property of animated bodies of producing their like belongs to them not as a primordial property, not by any blind necessity in the nature of things, but as the effect of economy, wisdom, and design. Because the property itself assumes diversities and submits to deviations, dictated by intelligible utilities and serving distinct purposes of animal happiness. The opinion which would consider generation as a principle in nature, and which would assign this principle as the cause, or endeavor to satisfy our minds with such a cause, of the existence of organized bodies, is confuted, in my judgment, not only by every mark of contrivance discoverable in those bodies, for which it gives us no contriver, offers no account whatever, but also by the farther consideration that things generated possess a clear relation to things not generated. If it were merely one part of a generated body bearing a relation to another part of the same body, as the mouth of an animal to the throat, the throat to the stomach, the stomach to the intestines, those to the recruiting of the blood, and, by means of the blood, to the nourishment of the whole frame, or if it were only one generated body bearing a relation to another generated body, as the sexes of the same species to each other, animals of prey to their prey, herbivorous and granivorous animals to the plants or seeds upon which they feed, it might be contended that the whole of this correspondency was attributable to generation, the common origin from which these substances proceeded. But what shall we say to agreements which exist between things generated and things not generated? 
Can it be doubted, was it ever doubted, but that the lungs of animals bear a relation to the air as a permanently elastic fluid? They act in it and by it. They cannot act without it. Now, if generation produced the animal, it did not produce the air, yet their properties correspond. The eye is made for light, and light for the eye. The eye would be of no use without light, and light perhaps of little without eyes. Yet one is produced by generation, the other not. The ear depends upon undulations of air. Here are two sets of motions, first, of the pulses of the air, secondly, of the drum, bones, and nerves of the ear, sets of motions bearing an evident reference to each other, yet the one, and the apparatus for the one, produced by the intervention of generation, the other altogether independent of it. If it be said that the air, the light, the elements, the world itself, is generated, I answer that I do not comprehend the proposition. If the term mean anything, similar to what it means when applied to plants or animals, the proposition is certainly without proof, and, I think, draws as near to absurdity as any proposition can do which does not include a contradiction in its terms. I am at a loss to conceive how the formation of the world can be compared to the generation of an animal. If the term generation signify something quite different from what it signifies on ordinary occasions, it may, by the same latitude, signify anything. In which case, a word or phrase taken from the language of Otaheite would convey as much theory concerning the origin of the universe as it does to talk of its being generated. We know a cause, intelligence, adequate to the appearances which we wish to account for. We have this cause continually producing similar appearances, yet rejecting this cause, the sufficiency of which we know, and the action of which is constantly before our eyes, we are invited to resort to suppositions, destitute of a single fact for their support, and confirmed by no analogy with which we are acquainted. Were it necessary to inquire into the motives of men's opinions, I mean their motives separate from their arguments, I should almost suspect that, because the proof of a deity drawn from the constitution of nature is not only popular but vulgar, which may arise from the cogency of the proof and be indeed its highest recommendation, and because it is a species almost of puerility to take up with it, for these reasons, minds which are habitually in search of invention and originality, feel a resistless inclination to strike off into other solutions and other expositions. The truth is that many minds are not so indisposed to anything which can be offered to them as they are to the flatness of being content with common reasons, and what is most to be lamented, minds conscious of superiority are the most liable to this repugnancy. The suppositions here alluded to all agree in one character. They all endeavor to dispense with the necessity in nature of a particular personal intelligence. That is to say, with the exertion of an intending, contriving mind in the structure and formation of the organized constitutions which the world contains. They would resolve all productions into unconscious energies of a like kind in that respect with attraction, magnetism, electricity, etc., without anything further. In this the old system of atheism and the new agree, and I much doubt whether the new schemes have advanced anything upon the old or done more than change the terms of the nomenclature. For instance, I could never see the difference between the antiquated system of atoms and Buffon's organic molecules. This philosopher, having made a planet by knocking off from the sun a piece of melted glass in consequence of the stroke of a comet, and having set it in motion by the same stroke both round its own axis and the sun, finds his next difficulty to be how to bring plants and animals upon it. In order to solve this difficulty, we are to suppose the universe replenished with particles, endowed with life, but without organization or senses of their own, and endowed also with a tendency to marshal themselves into organized forms. The concourse of these particles, by virtue of this tendency, but without intelligence, will, or direction, for I do not find that any of these qualities are ascribed to them, has produced the living forms which we now see. Very few of the conjectures which philosophers hazard upon these subjects have more of pretension in them than the challenging you to show the direct impossibility of the hypothesis. In the present example, there seemed to be a positive objection to the whole scheme upon the very face of it, which was that, if the case were as here represented, new combinations ought to be perpetually taking place. New plants and animals, or organized bodies which were neither, ought to be starting up before our eyes every day. For this, however, our philosopher has an answer. Whilst so many forms of plants and animals are already in existence, 
and consequently so many internal molds as he calls them are prepared and at hand the organic particles run into these molds and are employed in supplying an accession of substance to them as well for their growth as for their propagation by which means things keep their ancient course but says the same philosopher should any general loss or destruction of the present constitution of organized bodies take place the particles for want of molds into which they might enter would run into different combinations and replenish the waste with new species of organized substances is there any history to countenance this notion is it known that any destruction has been so repaired any desert thus repeopled so far as i remember the only natural appearance mentioned by our author by way of fact whereon to build his hypothesis is the formation of worms in the intestines of animals which is here ascribed to the coalition of superabundant organic particles floating about in the first passages and which have combined themselves into these simple animal forms for want of internal moulds or of vacancies in those moulds into which they might be received the thing referred to is rather a species of facts than a single fact as some other cases may with equal reason be included under it but to make it a fact at all or in any sort applicable to the question we must begin with asserting an equivocal generation contrary to analogy and without necessity contrary to an analogy which accompanies us to the very limits of our knowledge or inquiries for wherever either in plants or animals we are able to examine the subject we find procreation from apparent form without necessity for i apprehend that it is seldom difficult to suggest methods by which the eggs or spawn or yet invisible rudiments of these vermin may have obtained a passage into the cavities in which they are found footnote i trust i may be excused for not citing as another fact which is to confirm the hypothesis a grave assertion of this writer that the branches of trees upon which the stag feeds break out again in his horns such facts merit no discussion End of footnote. add to this that their constancy to their species which i believe is as regular in these as in the other vermes decides the question against our philosopher if in truth any question remained upon the subject lastly these wonder-working instruments these internal moulds what are they after all what when examined but a name without signification unintelligible if not self-contradictory at the best differing in nothing from the essential forms of the greek philosophy one short sentence of buffon's work exhibits his scheme as follows Quote, when this nutritious and prolific matter which is diffused throughout all nature passes through the internal mould of an animal or vegetable and finds a proper matrix or receptacle, it gives rise to an animal or vegetable of the same species. Close quote. Does any reader annex a meaning to the expression internal mold in this sentence? Ought it then to be said that, though we have little notion of an internal mold, we have not much more of a designing mind? The very contrary of this assertion is the truth. When we speak of an artificer or an architect, we talk of what is comprehensible to our understanding and familiar to our experience we use no other terms than what refer us for their meaning to our consciousness and observation what express the constant objects of both whereas names like that we have mentioned refer us to nothing excite no idea convey a sound to the ear but i think do no more another system which has lately been brought forward and with much ingenuity is that of appetencies the principle and the short account of the theory is this pieces of soft ductile matter being endued with propensities or appetencies for particular actions, would by continual endeavors carried on through a long series of generations work themselves gradually into suitable forms, and at length acquire, though perhaps by obscure and almost imperceptible improvements, an organization fitted to the action which their respective propensities led them to exert. A piece of animated matter, for example, that was endued with a propensity to fly, though ever so shapeless, though no other we will suppose than a round ball to begin with, would, in a course of ages, if not in a million of years, perhaps in a hundred millions of years, for our theorists having eternity to dispose of are never sparing in time, acquire wings. The same tendency to locomotion in an aquatic animal, or rather an animated lump which might happen to be surrounded by water, would end in the production of fins. In a living substance confined to the solid earth, would put out legs and feet, or, if it took a different turn, would break the body into ringlets and conclude by crawling upon the ground. 
Although I have introduced the mention of this theory into this place, I am unwilling to give to it the name of an atheistic scheme for two reasons. First, because, so far as I am able to understand it, the original propensities and the numberless varieties of them, so different in this respect from the laws of mechanical nature, which are few and simple, are, in the plant itself, attributed to the ordination and appointment of an intelligent and designing creator. Secondly, because, likewise, that large postulatum which is all along assumed and presupposed, the faculty in living bodies of producing other bodies organized like themselves, seems to be referred to the same cause, at least is not attempted to be accounted for by any other. In one important respect, however, the theory before us coincides with atheistic systems, viz., in that, in the formation of plants and animals, in the structure and use of their parts, it does away final causes. Instead of the parts of a plant or animal, or the particular structure of the parts, having been intended for the action or the use to which we see them applied, according to this theory they have themselves grown out of that action, sprung from that use. The theory, therefore, dispenses with that which we insist upon, the necessity in each particular case of an intelligent designing mind for the contriving and determining of the forms which organized bodies bear. Give our philosopher these appetencies, give him a portion of living irritable matter, a nerve or the clipping of a nerve, to work upon, give also to his incipient or progressive forms the power in every stage of their alteration of propagating their like, and, if he is to be believed, he could replenish the world with all the vegetable and animal productions which we at present see in it. The scheme under consideration is open to the same objection with other conjectures of a similar tendency, viz. a total defect of evidence. No changes like those which the theory requires have ever been observed. All the changes in Ovid's metamorphoses might have been effected by these appetencies if the theory were true. Yet not an example, nor the pretense of an example, is offered of a single change being known to have taken place. Nor is the order of generation obedient to the principle upon which this theory is built. The mammae of the male have not vanished by inusitation. Nec curtorum per multa secula judaeorum propagini deest preputium. Footnote. I confess myself totally at a loss to guess at the reason, either final or efficient, for this part of the animal frame unless there be some foundation for an opinion, of which I draw the hint from a paper of Mr. Everard Holm, Philosophical Transactions, 1799, page 2, viz. that the mammae of the fetus may be formed before the sex is determined. End of footnote. It is easy to say, and it has been said, that the alternative process is too slow to be perceived, that it has been carried on through tracts of immeasurable time and that the present order of things is the result of a gradation of which no human record can trace the steps. It is easy to say this, and yet it is still true that the hypothesis remains destitute of evidence. The analogies which have been alleged are of the following kind. The bunch of a camel is said to be no other than the effect of carrying burthens, a service in which the species has been employed from the most ancient times of the world. The first race, by the daily loading of the back, would probably find a small grumous tumor to be formed in the flesh of that part. The next progeny would bring this tumor into the world with them. The life to which they were destined would increase it. The cause which first generated the tubercle, being continued, it would go on, through every succession, to augment its size till it attained the form and the bulk under which it now appears. This may serve for one instance. Another, and that also of the passive sort, is taken from certain species of birds. Birds of the crane kind, as the crane itself, the heron, bittern, stork, have in general their thighs bare of feathers. This privation is accounted for from the habit of wading in water, and from the effect of that element to check the growth of feathers upon these parts. In consequence of which, the health and vegetation of the feathers declined through each generation of the animal, the tender down, exposed to cold and wetness, became weak and thin and rare, till the deterioration ended in the result which we see of absolute nakedness. I will mention a third instance, because it is drawn from an active habit, as the two last were from passive habits, and that is the pouch of the pelican. The description which naturalists give of this organ is as follows. Quote, from the lower edges of the under chap hangs a bag, reaching from the whole length of the bill to the neck, which is said to be capable of containing fifteen quarts of water. This bag the bird has the power of wrinkling up into the hollow of the underchap. When the bag is empty, it is not seen. 
but when the bird has fished with success, it is incredible to what an extent it is often dilated. The first thing the pelican does in fishing is to fill the bag, and then it returns to digest its burthen at leisure. The bird preys upon the large fishes and hides them by dozens in its pouch. When the bill is opened to its widest extent, a person may run his head into the bird's mouth and conceal it in this monstrous pouch, thus adapted for very singular purposes. Close quote. Now this extraordinary confirmation is nothing more, say our philosophers, than the result of habit, not of the habit or effort of a single pelican, or of a single race of pelicans, but of a habit perpetuated through a long series of generations. The pelican soon found the conveniency of reserving in its mouth, when its appetite was glutted, the remainder of its prey, which is fish. The fullness produced by this attempt, of course, stretched the skin which lies between the underchaps as being the most yielding part of the mouth. Every distension increased the cavity. The original bird, and many generations which succeeded him, might find difficulty enough in making the pouch answer this purpose, but future pelicans, entering upon life with a pouch derived from their progenitors of considerable capacity, would more readily accelerate its advance to perfection by frequently pressing down the sack with the weight of fish which it might now be made to contain. These, or of this kind, are the analogies relied upon. Now, in the first place, the instances themselves are unauthenticated by testimony, and in theory, to say the least of them, open to great objections. Whoever read of camels without bunches, or with bunches less than those with which they are at present usually formed? A bunch, not unlike the camels, is found between the shoulders of the buffalo, of the origin of which it is impossible to give the account which is here given. In the second example, why should the application of water, which appears to promote and thicken the growth of feathers upon the bodies and breasts of geese and swans and other water fowls, have divested of this covering the thighs of cranes? The third instance, which appears to me as plausible as any that can be produced, has this against it, that it is a singularity restricted to the species, whereas if it had its commencement in the cause and manner which have been assigned, the like confirmation might be expected to take place in other birds which feed upon fish. How comes it to pass that the pelican alone was the inventress, and her descendants the only inheritors, of this curious resource? But it is the less necessary to controvert the instances themselves, as it is a straining of analogy beyond all limits of reason and credibility, to assert that birds and beasts and fish, with all their variety and complexity of organization, have been brought into their forms, and distinguished into their several kinds and natures, by the same process, even if that process could be demonstrated or had ever been actually noticed, as might seem to serve for the gradual generation of a camel's bunch or a pelican's pouch. The solution, when applied to the works of nature generally, is contradicted by many of the phenomena, and totally inadequate to others. The ligaments or strictures by which the tendons are tied down at the angles of the joints could by no possibility be formed by the motion or exercise of the tendons themselves, by any appetency exciting these parts into action, or by any tendency arising therefrom. The tendency is all the other way, the conatus in constant opposition to them. Length of time does not help the case at all, but the reverse. The valves also in the blood vessels could never be formed in the manner which our theorist proposes, the blood, in its right and natural course, has no tendency to form them. When obstructed or refluent, it has the contrary. These parts could not grow out of their use, though they had eternity to grow in. The senses of animals appear to me altogether incapable of receiving the explanation of their origin which this theory affords. Including under the word sense, the organ and the perception, we have no account of either. How will our philosopher get at vision, or make an eye? How should the blind animal affect sight, of which blind animals, we know, have neither conception nor desire? Affecting it, by what operation of its will, by what endeavor to see, could it so determine the fluids of its body as to inchoate the formation of an eye, or suppose the eye formed, would the perception follow? The same of the other senses. And this objection holds its force, ascribe what you will to the hand of time, to the power of habit, to changes too slow to be observed by man, or brought within any comparison which he is able to make of past things with the present. Concede what you please to these arbitrary and unattested suppositions, how will they help you? Here is no inception, no laws, no course, no powers of nature which prevail at present, nor any analogous to these, would give commencement to a new sense. 
and it is in vain to inquire how that might proceed which could never begin. I think the senses to be the most inconsistent with the hypothesis before us of any part of the animal frame. But other parts are sufficiently so. The solution does not apply to the parts of animals which have little in them of motion. If we could suppose joints and muscles to be gradually formed by action and exercise, what action or exercise could form a skull or fill it with brains? No effort of the animal could determine the clothing of its skin. What conatus could give prickles to the porcupine or hedgehog, or to the sheep its fleece? In the last place, what do these appetencies mean when applied to plants? I am not able to give a signification to the term which can be transferred from animals to plants, or which is common to both. Yet a no less successful organization is found in plants than what obtains in animals. A solution is wanted for one as well as the other. Upon the whole, after all the schemes and struggles of a reluctant philosophy, the necessary resort is to a deity. The marks of design are too strong to be gotten over. Design must have had a designer. That designer must have been a person. That person is God. End of section 26「Section 27 of Natural Theology » by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Of the Natural Attributes of the Deity It is an immense conclusion that there is a God, a perceiving, intelligent, designing being, at the head of creation and from whose will it proceeded. The attributes of such a being, suppose his reality to be proved, must be adequate to the magnitude, extent, and multiplicity of his operations, which are not only vast beyond comparison with those performed by any other power, but, so far as respects our conceptions of them, infinite, because they are unlimited on all sides. Yet the contemplation of a nature so exalted, however surely we arrive at the proof of its existence, overwhelms our faculties. The mind feels its powers sink under the subject. One consequence of which is, that from painful abstraction the thoughts seek relief in sensible images. Whence may be deduced the ancient and almost universal propensity to idolatrous substitutions. They are the resources of a laboring imagination. False religions usually fall in with the natural propensity. True religions, or such as have derived themselves from the true, resist it. It is one of the advantages of the revelations which we acknowledge that, whilst they reject idolatry with its many pernicious accompaniments, they introduce the deity to human apprehension under an idea more personal, more determinate, more within its compass, than the theology of nature can do. And this they do by representing him exclusively under the relation in which he stands to ourselves, and, for the most part, under some precise character, resulting from that relation, or from the history of his providences which method suits the span of our intellects much better than the universality which enters into the idea of God as deduced from the views of nature. When, therefore, these representations are well founded in point of authority, for all depends upon that, they afford a condescension to the state of our faculties, of which they, who have most reflected on the subject, will be the first to acknowledge the want and the value. Nevertheless, if we be careful to imitate the documents of our religion, by confining our explanations to what concerns ourselves, and do not affect more precision in our ideas than the subject allows of, the several terms which are employed to denote the attributes of the deity may be made, even in natural religion, to bear a sense consistent with truth and reason, and not surpassing our comprehension. These terms are omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, eternity, self-existence, necessary existence, spirituality. Omnipotence, omniscience, infinite power, infinite knowledge are superlatives, expressing our conception of these attributes in the strongest and most elevated terms which language supplies. We ascribe power to the deity under the name of omnipotence, the strict and correct conclusion being that a power which could create such a world as this must be, beyond all comparison, greater than any which we experience in ourselves, than any which we observe in other visible agents, greater also than any which we can want for our individual protection and preservation in the being upon whom we depend. It is a power, likewise, to which we are not authorized by our observation or knowledge to assign any limits of space or duration. 
very much of the same sort of remark is applicable to the term omniscience, infinite knowledge or infinite wisdom. In strictness of language, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom, wisdom always supposing action and action directed by it. With respect to the first, viz. knowledge, the Creator must know intimately the constitution and properties of the things which He created, which seems also to imply a foreknowledge of their action upon one another and of their changes, at least so far as the same result from trains of physical and necessary causes. His omniscience also, as far as respects things present, is deducible from his nature as an intelligent being joined with the extent, or rather the universality, of his operations. Where he acts, he is, and where he is, he perceives. The wisdom of the deity, as testified in the works of creation, surpasses all idea we have of wisdom, drawn from the highest intellectual operations of the highest class of intelligent beings with whom we are acquainted, and which is of the chief importance to us, whatever be its compass or extent, which it is evidently impossible that we should be able to determine, it must be adequate to the conduct of that order of things under which we live. And this is enough. It is of very inferior consequence by what terms we express our notion, or rather our admiration, of this attribute. The terms which the piety and the usage of language have rendered habitual to us may be as proper as any other. We can trace this attribute much beyond what is necessary for any conclusion to which we have occasion to apply it. The degree of knowledge and power requisite for the formation of created nature cannot, with respect to us, be distinguished from infinite. The divine omnipresence stands, in natural theology, upon this foundation. In every part and place of the universe with which we are acquainted, we perceive the exertion of a power which we believe, mediately or immediately, to proceed from the deity. For instance, in what part or point of space that has ever been explored do we not discover attraction? In what regions do we not find light? In what accessible portion of our globe do we not meet with gravity, magnetism, electricity, together with the properties also and powers of organized substances of vegetable or of animated nature? Nay, further, we may ask, what kingdom is there of nature, what corner of space, in which there is anything that can be examined by us, where we do not fall upon contrivance and design. The only reflection, perhaps, which arises in our minds from this view of the world around us is that the laws of nature everywhere prevail, that they are uniform and universal. But what do we mean by the laws of nature, or by any law? Effects are produced by power, not by laws. A law cannot execute itself. A law refers us to an agent. Now, an agency so general as that we cannot discover its absence or assign the place in which some effect of its continued energy is not found, may, in popular language at least, and perhaps without much deviation from philosophical strictness, be called universal, and with not quite the same, but with no inconsiderable propriety, the person or being in whom that power resides, or from whom it is derived, may be taken to be omnipresent. He who upholds all things by his power may be said to be everywhere present. This is called a virtual presence. There is also what metaphysicians denominate an essential ubiquity, and which idea the language of scripture seems to favor. But the former, I think, goes as far as natural theology carries us. Eternity is a negative idea, clothed with a positive name. It supposes, in that to which it is applied, a present existence, and is the negation of a beginning or an end of that existence. As applied to the deity, it has not been controverted by those who acknowledge a deity at all. Most assuredly, there never was a time in which nothing existed, because that condition must have continued. The universal blank must have remained. Nothing could rise up out of it, nothing could ever have existed since, nothing could exist now. In strictness, however, we have no concern with duration prior to that of the visible world. Upon this article, therefore, of theology, it is sufficient to know that the contriver necessarily existed before the contrivance. Self-existence is another negative idea, viz. the negation of a preceding cause, as of a progenitor, a maker, an author, a creator. Necessary existence means demonstrable existence. Spirituality expresses an idea made up of a negative part and of a positive part. The negative part consists in the exclusion of some of the known properties of matter, especially of solidity, of the vis inertiae, and of gravitation. The positive part comprises perception, thought, 
will, power, action, by which last term is meant the origination of motion, the quality perhaps in which resides the essential superiority of spirit over matter, which cannot move unless it be moved, and cannot but move when impelled by another. I apprehend that there can be no difficulty in applying to the deity both parts of this idea. Chapter 25. Of the Unity of the Deity. Of the unity of the deity, the proof is the uniformity of plan observable in the universe. The universe itself is a system, each part either depending upon other parts, or being connected with other parts, by some common law of motion, or by the presence of some common substance. One principle of gravitation causes a stone to drop towards the earth, and the moon to wheel round it. One law of attraction carries all the different planets about the sun. This philosophers demonstrate. There are also other points of agreement amongst them, which may be considered as marks of the identity of their origin and of their intelligent author. In all are found the conveniency and stability derived from gravitation. They all experience vicissitudes of days and nights, and changes of season. They all, at least Jupiter, Mars, and Venus, have the same advantages from their atmospheres as we have. In all the planets, the axes of rotation are permanent. Nothing is more probable than that the same attracting influence, acting according to the same rule, reaches to the fixed stars. But if this be only probable, another thing is certain, viz., that the same element of light does. The light from a fixed star affects our eyes in the same manner, is refracted and reflected according to the same laws as the light of a candle. The velocity of the light of the fixed stars is also the same as the velocity of the light of the sun, reflected from the satellites of Jupiter. The heat of the sun in kind differs nothing from the heat of a coal fire. In our own globe the case is clearer. New countries are continually discovered, but the old laws of nature are always found in them. New plants, perhaps, or animals, but always in company with plants and animals which we already know, and always possessing many of the same general properties. We never get amongst such original or totally different modes of existence as to indicate that we are come into the province of a different creator or under the direction of a different will. In truth, the same order of things attends us wherever we go. The elements act upon one another, electricity operates, the tides rise and fall, the magnetic needle elects its position in one region of the earth and sea as well as in another. One atmosphere invests all parts of the globe and connects all. One sun illuminates. One moon exerts its specific attraction upon all parts. If there be a variety in natural effects, as, e.g., in the tides of different seas, that very variety is the result of the same cause acting under different circumstances. In many cases this is proved. In all is probable. The inspection and comparison of living forms add to this argument examples without number. Of all large terrestrial animals, the structure is very much alike. Their senses nearly the same, their natural functions and passions nearly the same, their viscera nearly the same, both in substance, shape, and office, digestion, nutrition, circulation, secretion, go on, in a similar manner, in all, the great circulating fluid is the same. For, I think, no difference has been discovered in the properties of blood from whatever animal it be drawn. The experiment of transfusion proves that the blood of one animal will serve for another. The skeletons also of the larger terrestrial animals show particular varieties, but still under a great general affinity. The resemblance is somewhat less, yet sufficiently evident, between quadrupeds and birds. They are all alike in five respects for one in which they differ. In fish, which belong to another department, as it were, of nature, the points of comparison become fewer, but we never lose sight of our analogy e.g. we still meet with a stomach, a liver, a spine, with bile and blood, with teeth, with eyes, which eyes are only slightly varied from our own, and which variation in truth demonstrates not an interruption, but a continuance of the same exquisite plan, for it is the adaptation of the organ to the element, viz. to the different refraction of light passing into the eye out of a denser medium. The provinces also themselves of water and earth are connected by the species of animals which inhabit both and also by a large tribe of aquatic animals which closely resemble the terrestrial in their internal structure. I mean the cetaceous tribe, which have hot blood, respiring lungs, bowels, and other essential parts like those of land animals. This similitude surely bespeaks the same creation and the same creator. 
Insects and shellfish appear to me to differ from other classes of animals the most widely of any, yet even here, besides many points of particular resemblance, there exists a general relation of a peculiar kind. It is the relation of inversion, the law of contrariety, viz. that whereas in other animals the bones to which the muscles are attached lie within the body, in insects and shellfish they lie on the outside of it. The shell of a lobster performs to the animal the office of a bone, by furnishing to the tendons that fixed basis or immovable fulcrum without which, mechanically, they could not act. The crust of an insect is its shell and answers the like purpose. The shell also of an oyster stands in the place of a bone, the basis of the muscles being fixed to it in the same manner as in other animals they are fixed to the bones, all which, under wonderful varieties indeed and adaptations of form, confesses an imitation, a remembrance, a carrying on of the same plan. The observations here made are equally applicable to plants, but, I think, unnecessary to be pursued. It is a very striking circumstance, and alone sufficient to prove all which we contend for, that, in this part, likewise, of organized nature, we perceive a continuation of the sexual system. Certain, however, it is that the whole argument for the divine unity goes no further than to unity of counsel. It may likewise be acknowledged that no arguments which we are in possession of exclude the ministry of subordinate agents. If such there be, they act under a presiding, a controlling will, because they act according to certain general restrictions, by certain common rules, and, as it should seem, upon a general plan. But still such agents, and different ranks and classes and degrees of them, may be employed. End of section 27 Section 28 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 of The Goodness of the Deity, Part 1. The proof of the divine goodness rests upon two propositions, each, as we contend, capable of being made out by observations drawn from the appearances of nature. The first is that in a vast plurality of instances in which contrivance is perceived, the design of the contrivance is beneficial. The second, that the deity has superadded pleasure to animal sensations beyond what was necessary for any other purpose, or when the purpose, so far as it was necessary, might have been effected by the operation of pain. First, in a vast plurality of instances in which contrivance is perceived, the design of the contrivance is beneficial. No productions of nature display contrivance so manifestly as the parts of animals and the parts of animals have all of them, I believe, a real, and, with very few exceptions, all of them a known and intelligible subserviency to the use of the animal. Now, when the multitude of animals is considered, the number of parts in each, their figure and fitness, the faculties depending upon them, the variety of species, the complexity of structure, the success, in so many cases, and felicity of the result, we can never reflect, without the profoundest adoration, upon the character of that being from whom all these things have proceeded. We cannot help acknowledging what an exertion of benevolence creation was, of a benevolence how minute in its care, how vast in its comprehension. When we appeal to the parts and faculties of animals, and to the limbs and senses of animals in particular, we state, I conceive, the proper medium of proof for the conclusion which we wish to establish. I will not say that the insensible parts of nature are made solely for the sensitive parts, but this I say, that, when we consider the benevolence of the deity, we can only consider it in relation to sensitive being. Without this reference, or referred to anything else, the attribute has no object, the term has no meaning. Dead matter is nothing. The parts, therefore, especially the limbs and senses, of animals, although they constitute in mass and quantity a small portion of the material creation, yet, since they alone are instruments of perception, they compose what may be called the whole of visible nature, estimated with a view to the disposition of its author. Consequently, it is in these that we are to seek his character. It is by these that we are to prove that the world was made with a benevolent design. Nor is the design abortive. It is a happy world, after all. The air, the earth, the water, teem with delighted existence. In a spring noon, or a summer evening, on whichever side I turn my eyes, Myriads of happy beings crowd upon my view. The insect youth are on the wing. Swarms of newborn flies are trying their pinions in the air. Their sportive motions, 
their wanton mazes, their gratuitous activity, their continual change of place without use or purpose, testify their joy and the exultation which they feel in their lately discovered faculties. A bee amongst the flowers in spring is one of the most cheerful objects that can be looked upon. Its life appears to be all enjoyment, so busy and so pleased, yet it is only a specimen of insect life, with which, by reason of the animal being half domesticated, we happen to be better acquainted than we are with that of others. The whole winged insect tribe, it is probable, are equally intent upon their proper employments, and, under every variety of constitution, gratified, and perhaps equally gratified, by the offices which the author of their nature has assigned to them. But the atmosphere is not the only scene of enjoyment for the insect race. Plants are covered with aphids, greedily sucking their juices, and constantly, as it should seem, in the act of sucking. It cannot be doubted but that this is a state of gratification. What else should fix them so close to the operation, and so long? Other species are running about with an alacrity in their motions which carries with it every mark of pleasure. Large patches of ground are sometimes half covered with these brisk and sprightly natures. If we look to what the waters produce, shoals of the fry of fish frequent the margins of rivers, of lakes, and of the sea itself. These are so happy that they know not what to do with themselves. Their attitudes, their vivacity, their leaps out of the water, their frolics in it, which I have noticed a thousand times with equal attention and amusement, all conduce to show their excess of spirits, and are simply the effects of that excess. Walking by the seaside in a calm evening, upon a sandy shore, and with an ebbing tide, I have frequently remarked the appearance of a dark cloud, or rather very thick mist, hanging over the edge of the water, to the height perhaps of half a yard, and of the breadth of two or three yards, stretching along the coast as far as the eye could reach, and always retiring with the water. When this cloud came to be examined, it proved to be nothing else than so much space filled with young shrimps, in the act of bounding into the air from the shallow margin of the water, or from the wet sand. If any motion of a mute animal could express delight, it was this. If they had meant to make signs of their happiness, they could not have done it more intelligibly. Suppose, then, what I have no doubt of, each individual of this number to be in a state of positive enjoyment, what a sum collectively of gratification and pleasure have we here before our view. The young of all animals appear to me to receive pleasure simply from the exercise of their limbs and bodily faculties, without reference to any end to be attained or any use to be answered by the exertion. A child, without knowing anything of the use of language, is in a high degree delighted with being able to speak. Its incessant repetition of the few articulate sounds, or perhaps of the single word which it has learnt to pronounce, proves this point clearly. Nor is it less pleased with its first successful endeavors to walk, or rather to run, which precedes walking, although entirely ignorant of the importance of the attainment to its future life, and even without applying it to any present purpose. A child is delighted with speaking, without having anything to say, and with walking, without knowing where to go. And, prior to both these, I am disposed to believe that the waking hours of infancy are agreeably taken up with the exercise of vision, or, perhaps more properly speaking, with learning to see. But it is not for youth alone that the great parent of creation hath provided. Happiness is found with the purring cat, no less than with the playful kitten. In the armchair of dozing age, as well as in either the sprightliness of the dance or the animation of the chase. To novelty, to acuteness of sensation, to hope, to ardor of pursuit, succeeds what is, in no considerable degree, an equivalent for them all, perception of ease. Herein is the exact difference between the young and the old. The young are not happy but when enjoying pleasure, the old are happy when free from pain. And this constitution suits with the degrees of animal power which they respectively possess. The vigor of youth was to be stimulated to action by impatience of rest, whilst to the imbecility of age, quietness and repose become positive gratifications. In one important respect, the advantage is with the old. A state of ease is, generally speaking, more attainable than a state of pleasure. A constitution, therefore, which can enjoy ease is preferable to that which can taste only pleasure. This same perception of ease oftentimes renders old age a condition of great comfort, especially when riding at its anchor after a busy or tempestuous life. It is well described by Rousseau to be the interval of repose and enjoyment between the hurry and the end of life. How far the same cause extends to other animal natures cannot be judged of with certainty. 
the appearance of satisfaction with which most animals as their activity subsides seek and enjoy rest affords reason to believe that this source of gratification is appointed to advanced life under all or most of its various forms in the species with which we are best acquainted namely our own i am far even as an observer of human life from thinking that youth is its happiest season much less the only happy one as a christian i am willing to believe that there is a great deal of truth in the following representation given by a very pious writer as well as excellent man Quote, to the intelligent and virtuous old age presents a scene of tranquil enjoyments of obedient appetites of well-regulated affections of maturity in knowledge and of calm preparation for immortality in this serene and dignified state placed as it were on the confines of two worlds the mind of a good man reviews what is past with the complacency of an approving conscience and looks forward with humble confidence in the mercy of god and with devout aspirations towards his eternal and ever-increasing favor Close quote. what is seen in different stages of the same life is still more exemplified in the lives of different animals animal enjoyments are infinitely diversified the modes of life to which the organization of different animals respectively determines them are not only of various but of opposite kinds yet each is happy in its own for instance animals of prey live much alone animals of a milder constitution in society yet the herring which lives in shoals and the sheep which lives in flocks are not more happy in a crowd or more contented amongst their companions than is the pike or the lion with the deep solitudes of the pool or the forest but it will be said that the instances which we have here brought forward whether of vivacity or repose or of apparent enjoyment derived from either are picked and favorable instances we answer first that they are instances nevertheless which comprise large provinces of sensitive existence that every case which we have described is the case of millions at this moment in every given moment of time how many myriads of animals are eating their food gratifying their appetites ruminating in their holes accomplishing their wishes pursuing their pleasures taking their pastimes in each individual how many things must go right for it to be at ease yet how large a proportion out of every species is so in every assignable instant secondly we contend in the terms of our original proposition that throughout the whole of life as it is diffused in nature and as far as we are acquainted with it looking to the average of sensations the plurality and the preponderancy is in favor of happiness by a vast excess in our own species in which perhaps the assertion may be more questionable than in any other the propolency of good over evil of health for example and ease over pain and distress is evinced by the very notice which calamities excite what inquiries does the sickness of our friends produce what conversation their misfortunes this shows that the common course of things is in favor of happiness that happiness is the rule misery the exception were the order reversed our attention would be called to examples of health and competency instead of disease and want one great cause of our insensibility to the goodness of the creator is the very extensiveness of his bounty we prize but little what we share only in common with the rest or with the generality of our species when we hear of blessings we think forthwith of successes of prosperous fortunes of honors riches preferments i e of those advantages and superiorities over others which we happen either to possess or to be in pursuit of or to covet the common benefits of our nature entirely escape us yet these are the great things these constitute what most properly ought to be accounted blessings of providence what alone if we might so speak are worthy of its care nightly rest and daily bread the ordinary use of our limbs and senses and understandings are gifts which admit of no comparison with any other yet because almost every man we meet with possesses these we leave them out of our enumeration they raise no sentiment they move no gratitude now herein is our judgment perverted by our selfishness a blessing ought in truth to be the more satisfactory the bounty at least of the donor is rendered more conspicuous by its very diffusion its commonness its cheapness by its falling to the lot and forming the happiness of the great bulk and body of our species as well as of ourselves nay even when we do not possess it it ought to be matter of thankfulness that others do but we have a different way of thinking we court distinction that is not the worst we see nothing but what has distinction to recommend it this necessarily contracts our views of the creator's beneficence within a narrow compass and most unjustly it is in those things which are so common as to be no distinction that the amplitude of the divine benignity is perceived 
but pain no doubt and privations exist in numerous instances and to a degree which collectively would be very great if they were compared with any other thing than with the mass of animal fruition for the application therefore of our proposition to that mixed state of things which these exceptions induce two rules are necessary and both i think just and fair rules one is that we regard those effects alone which are accompanied with proofs of intention the other that when we cannot resolve all appearances into benevolence of design we make the few give place to the many the little to the great that we take our judgment from a large and decided preponderancy if there be one i crave leave to transcribe into this place what i have said upon this subject in my moral philosophy Quote, when god created the human species either he wished their happiness or he wished their misery or he was indifferent and unconcerned about either if he had wished our misery he might have made sure of his purpose by forming our senses to be so many sores and pains to us as they are now instruments of gratification and enjoyment or by placing us amidst objects so ill suited to our perceptions as to have continually offended us instead of ministering to our refreshment and delight he might have made for example everything we tasted bitter everything we saw loathsome everything we touched a sting every smell a stench and every sound a discord if he had been indifferent about our happiness or misery we must impute to our good fortune as all designed by this supposition is excluded both the capacity of our senses to receive pleasure and the supply of external objects fitted to produce it but either of these and still more both of them being too much to be attributed to accident nothing remains but the first supposition that god when he created the human species wished their happiness and made for them the provision which he has made with that view and for that purpose the same argument may be proposed in different terms thus contrivance proves design and the predominant tendency of the contrivance indicates the disposition of the designer the world abounds with contrivances and all the contrivances which we are acquainted with are directed to beneficial purposes evil no doubt exists but it is never that we can perceive the object of contrivance teeth are contrived to eat not to ache their aching now and then is incidental to the contrivance perhaps inseparable from it or even if you will let it be called a defect in the contrivance but it is not the object of it this is a distinction which well deserves to be attended to in describing implements of husbandry he would hardly say of the sickle that it is made to cut the reaper's hand though from the construction of the instrument and the manner of using it this mischief often follows but if you had occasion to describe instruments of torture or execution this engine you would say is to extend the sinews this to dislocate the joints this to break the bones this to scorch the soles of the feet here pain and misery are the very objects of the contrivance now nothing of this sort is to be found in the works of nature we never discover a train of contrivance to bring about an evil purpose no anatomist ever discovered a system of organization calculated to produce pain or disease or in explaining the parts of the human body ever said this is to irritate this to inflame this duct is to convey the gravel to the kidneys this gland to secrete the humor which forms the gout if by chance he come at a part of which he knows not the use the most he can say is that it is useless no one ever suspects that it is put there to incommode to annoy or to torment Close quote the two cases which appeared to me to have the most of difficulty in them as forming the most of the appearance of exception to the representation here given are those of venomous animals and of animals preying upon one another these properties of animals wherever they are found must i think be referred to design because there is in all cases of the first and in most cases of the second an express and distinct organization provided for the producing of them under the first head the fangs of vipers the stings of wasps and scorpions are as clearly intended for their purpose as any animal structure is for any purpose the most incontestably beneficial and the same thing must under the second head be acknowledged of the talons and beaks of birds of the tusks teeth and claws of beasts of prey of the shark's mouth of the spider's web and of numberless weapons of offence belonging to different tribes of voracious insects we cannot therefore avoid the difficulty by saying that the effect was not intended the only question open to us is whether it be ultimately evil from the confessed and felt imperfection of our knowledge we ought to presume that there may be consequences of this economy which are hidden from us from the benevolence which pervades the general designs of nature we ought also to presume that these consequences if they could enter into our calculation would turn the balance on the favorable side both these i contend to be reasonable presumptions 
not reasonable presumptions if these two cases were the only cases which nature presented to our observation, but reasonable presumptions under the reflection that the cases in question are combined with a multitude of intentions, all proceeding from the same author, and all, except these, directed to ends of undisputed utility. Of the vindications, however, of this economy, which we are able to assign, such as most extenuate the difficulty, are the following. With respect to venomous bites and stings, it may be observed, 1. That the animal itself being regarded, the faculty complained of is good, being conducive in all cases to the defense of the animal, in some cases to the subduing of its prey, and in some probably to the killing of it when caught by a mortal wound inflicted in the passage to the stomach, which may be no less merciful to the victim than salutary to the devourer. In the viper, for instance, the poisonous fang may do that which, in other animals of prey, is done by the crush of the teeth. Frogs and mice might be swallowed alive without it. 2. But it will be said that this provision, when it comes to the case of bites, deadly even to human bodies and to those of large quadrupeds, is greatly overdone, that it might have fulfilled its use, and yet have been much less deleterious than it is. Now I believe the case of bites, which produce death in large animals, of stings I think there are none, to be very few. The experiments of the Abbe Fontana, which were numerous, go strongly to the proof of this point. He found that it required the action of five exasperated vipers to kill a dog of a moderate size, but that to the killing of a mouse or a frog a single bite was sufficient, which agrees with the use which we assign to the faculty. The abbe seemed to be of opinion that the bite even of the rattlesnake would not usually be mortal, allowing, however, that in certain particularly unfortunate cases, as when the puncture had touched some very tender part, pricked a principal nerve, for instance, or, as it is said, some more considerable lymphatic vessel, death might speedily ensue. 3. It has been, I think, very justly remarked concerning serpents, that, whilst only a few species possess the venomous property, that property guards the whole tribe. The most innocuous snake is avoided with as much care as a viper. Now the terror with which large animals regard this class of reptiles is its protection, and this terror is founded in the formidable revenge which a few of the number, compared with the whole, are capable of taking. The species of serpents, described by Linnaeus, amount to 218, of which 32 only are poisonous. 4. It seems to me that animal constitutions are provided not only for each element, but for each state of the elements, i.e. for every climate and for every temperature, and that part of the mischief complained of arises from animals, the human animal most especially, occupying situations upon the earth which do not belong to them, nor were ever intended for their habitation. The folly and wickedness of mankind, and necessities proceeding from these causes, have driven multitudes of the species to seek a refuge amongst burning sands, whilst countries blessed with hospitable skies, and with the most fertile soils, remain almost without a human tenant. We invade the territories of wild beasts and venomous reptiles, and then complain that we are infested by their bites and stings. Some accounts of Africa place this observation in a strong point of view. The deserts, says Adanson, quote, are entirely barren except where they are found to produce serpents, and in such quantities that some extensive plains are almost entirely covered with them. Close quote. These are the natures appropriated to the situation. Let them enjoy their existence, let them have their country. Surface enough will be left to man, though his numbers were increased a hundredfold, and left to him where he might live exempt from these annoyances. End of section twenty eight. Section 29 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 of The Goodness of the Deity, Part 2. The second case, viz. that of animals devouring one another, furnishes a consideration of much larger extent. To judge whether, as a general provision, this can be deemed an evil, even so far as we understand its consequences, which probably is a partial understanding, the following reflections are fit to be attended to. 1. Immortality upon this earth is out of the question. Without death there could be no generation, no sexes, no parental relation, i.e., as things are constituted, no animal happiness. The particular duration of life, assigned to different animals, can form no part of the objection, because whatever that duration be, whilst it remains finite and limited, it may always be asked why it is no longer. The natural age of different animals varies from a single day to a century of years. 
No account can be given of this, nor could any be given whatever other proportion of life had obtained amongst them. The term, then, of life in different animals being the same as it is, the question is, what mode of taking it away is the best, even for the animal itself? Now, according to the established order of nature, which we must suppose to prevail or we cannot reason at all upon the subject, the three methods by which life is usually put an end to are acute diseases, decay, and violence. The simple and natural life of brutes is not often visited by acute distempers, nor could it be deemed an improvement of their lot if they were. Let it be considered, therefore, in what a condition of suffering and misery a brute animal is placed which is left to perish by decay. In human sickness or infirmity there is the assistance of man's rational fellow-creatures, if not to alleviate his pains, at least to minister to his necessities and to supply the place of his own activity. A brute, in his wild and natural state, does everything for himself. When his strength, therefore, or his speed, or his limbs, or his senses, fail him, he is delivered over, either to absolute famine, or to the protracted wretchedness of a life slowly wasted by the scarcity of food. Is it then to see the world filled with drooping, superannuated, half-starved, helpless, and unhelped animals, that you would alter the present system of pursuit and prey? 2 which system is also to them the spring of motion and activity on both sides. The pursuit of its prey forms the employment and appears to constitute the pleasure of a considerable part of the animal creation. The using of the means of defense, or flight, or precaution, forms also the business of another part. And even of this latter tribe, we have no reason to suppose that their happiness is much molested by their fears. Their danger exists continually, and in some cases they seem to be so far sensible of it as to provide in the best manner they can against it. But it is only when the attack is actually made upon them that they appear to suffer from it. To contemplate the insecurity of their condition with anxiety and dread requires a degree of reflection which, happily for themselves, they do not possess. A hare, notwithstanding the number of its dangers and its enemies, is as playful an animal as any other. 3. But to do justice to the question, the system of animal destruction ought always to be considered in strict connection with another property of animal nature, viz. superfecundity. They are countervailing qualities. One subsists by the correction of the other. In treating, therefore, of the subject under this view, which is, I believe, the true one, our business will be, first, to point out the advantages which are gained by the powers in nature of a superabundant multiplication, and then to show that these advantages are so many reasons for appointing that system of national hostilities which we are endeavoring to account for. In almost all cases, nature produces her supplies with profusion. A single codfish spawns, in one season, a greater number of eggs than all the inhabitants of England amount to. A thousand other instances of prolific generation might be stated which, though not equal to this, would carry on the increase of the species with a rapidity which outruns calculation, and to an immeasurable extent. The advantages of such a constitution are two. First, that it tends to keep the world always full, whilst, secondly, it allows the proportion between the several species of animals to be differently modified as different purposes require, or as different situations may afford for them room and food. Where this vast fecundity meets with a vacancy fitted to receive the species, there it operates with its whole effect. There it pours in its numbers and replenishes the waste. We complain of what we call the exorbitant multiplication of some troublesome insects, not reflecting that large portions of nature might be left void without it. If the accounts of travelers may be depended upon, immense tracts of forests in North America would be nearly lost to sensitive existence if it were not for gnats. Quote, in the thinly inhabited regions of America, in which the waters stagnate and the climate is warm, the whole air is filled with crowds of these insects. Close quote. Thus it is that where we looked for solitude and death-like silence, we meet with animation, activity, enjoyment, with a busy, a happy, and a peopled world. Again, hosts of mice are reckoned amongst the plagues of the northeast part of Europe, whereas vast plains in Siberia, as we learn from good authority, would be lifeless without them. The Caspian deserts are converted by their presence into crowded warrens. Between the Volga and the Yaik, and in the country of Hyrcania, the ground, says Pallas, is in many places covered with little hills raised by the earth cast out in forming the burrows. 
do we so envy these blissful abodes as to pronounce the fecundity by which they are supplied with inhabitants to be an evil a subject of complaint and not of praise further by virtue of this same superfecundity what we term destruction becomes almost instantly the parent of life what we call blights are oftentimes legions of animated beings claiming their portion in the bounty of nature what corrupts the produce of the earth to us prepares it for them and it is by means of their rapid multiplication that they take possession of their pasture a slow propagation would not meet the opportunity but in conjunction with the occasional use of this fruitfulness we observe also that it allows the proportion between the several species of animals to be differently modified as different purposes of utility may require when the forests of america come to be cleared and the swamps drained our gnats will give place to other inhabitants if the population of europe should spread to the north and the east the mice will retire before the husbandman and the shepherd and yield their station to herds and flocks in what concerns the human species it may be a part of the scheme of providence that the earth should be inhabited by a shifting or perhaps a circulating population in this economy it is possible that there may be the following advantages when old countries are become exceedingly corrupt simpler modes of life purer morals and better institutions may rise up in new ones whilst fresh soils reward the cultivator with more plentiful returns thus the different portions of the globe come into use in succession as the residence of man and in his absence entertain other guests which by their sudden multiplication fill the chasm in domesticated animals we find the effect of their fecundity to be that we can always command numbers we can always have as many of any particular species as we please or as we can support nor do we complain of its excess it being much more easy to regulate abundance than to supply scarcity but then this superfecundity though of great occasional use and importance exceeds the ordinary capacity of nature to receive or support its progeny all superabundance supposes destruction or must destroy itself perhaps there is no species of terrestrial animals whatever which would not overrun the earth if it were permitted to multiply in perfect safety or of fish which would not fill the ocean at least if any single species were left to their natural increase without disturbance or restraint the food of other species would be exhausted by their maintenance it is necessary therefore that the effects of such prolific faculties be curtailed in conjunction with other checks and limits all subservient to the same purpose are the thinnings which take place among animals by their action upon one another in some instances we ourselves experience very directly the use of these hostilities one species of insects rids us of another species or reduces their ranks a third species perhaps keeps the second within bounds and birds or lizards are offense against the inordinate increase by which even these last might infest us in other more numerous and possibly more important instances this disposition of things although less necessary or useful to us and of course less observed by us may be necessary and useful to certain other species or even for the preventing of the loss of certain species from the universe a misfortune which seems to be studiously guarded against though there may be the appearance of failure in some of the details of nature's works in her great purposes there never are her species never fail the provision which was originally made for continuing the replenishment of the world has proved itself to be effectual through a long succession of ages what further shows that the system of destruction amongst animals holds an express relation to the system of fecundity that they are parts indeed of one compensatory scheme is that in each species the fecundity bears a proportion to the smallness of the animal to the weakness to the shortness of its natural term of life and to the dangers and enemies by which it is surrounded an elephant produces but one calf a butterfly lays six hundred eggs birds of prey seldom produce more than two eggs the sparrow tribe and the duck tribe frequently sit upon a dozen in the rivers we meet with a thousand minnows for one pike in the sea a million of herrings for a single shark compensation obtains throughout defenselessness and devastation are repaired by fecundity we have dwelt the longer on these considerations because the subject to which they apply namely that of animals devouring one another forms the chief if not the only instance in the works of the deity of an economy stamped by marks of design in which the character of utility can be called in question the case of venomous animals is of much inferior consequence to the case of prey and in some degree is also included under it to both cases it is probable that many more reasons belong than those of which we are in possession 
Our first proposition, and that which we have hitherto been defending, was that in a vast plurality of instances in which contrivance is perceived, the design of the contrivance is beneficial. Our second proposition is that the deity has added pleasure to animal sensations beyond what was necessary for any other purpose, or when the purpose, so far as it was necessary, might have been effected by the operation of pain. This proposition may be thus explained. The capacities which, according to the established course of nature, are necessary to the support or preservation of an animal, however manifestly they may be the result of an organization contrived for the purpose, can only be deemed an act or a part of the same will as that which decreed the existence of the animal itself. Because, whether the creation proceeded from a benevolent or a malevolent being, these capacities must have been given if the animal existed at all. Animal properties, therefore, which fall under this description, do not strictly prove the goodness of God. They may prove the existence of the deity, they may prove a high degree of power and intelligence, but they do not prove his goodness, forasmuch as they must have been found in any creation which was capable of continuance, although it is possible to suppose that such a creation might have been produced by a being whose views rested upon misery. But there is a class of properties which may be said to be superadded from an intention expressly directed to happiness an intention to give a happy existence distinct from the general intention of providing the means of existence, and that is, of capacities for pleasure in cases wherein, so far as the conservation of the individual or of the species is concerned, they were not wanted, or wherein the purpose might have been secured by the operation of pain. The provision which is made of a variety of objects, not necessary to life, and ministering only to our pleasure, and the properties given to the necessaries of life themselves, by which they contribute to pleasure as well as preservation, show a further design than that of giving existence. Footnote. See this topic considered in Dr. Balgai's Treatise Upon the Divine Benevolence. This excellent author first, I think, proposed it, and nearly in the terms in which it is here stated. Some other observations also under this head are taken from that treatise. End of footnote. A single instance will make all this clear. Assuming the necessity of food for the support of animal life, it is requisite that the animal be provided with organs fitted for the procuring, receiving, and digesting of its food. It may also be necessary that the animal be impelled by its sensations to exert its organs. But the pain of hunger would do all this. Why add pleasure to the act of eating, sweetness and relish to food? Why a new and appropriate sense for the perception of the pleasure? Why should the juice of a peach applied to the palate affect the part so differently from what it does when rubbed upon the palm of the hand. This is a constitution which, so far as appears to me, can be resolved into nothing but the pure benevolence of the Creator. Eating is necessary, but the pleasure attending it is not necessary, and that this pleasure depends not only upon our being in possession of the sense of taste, which is different from every other, but upon a particular state of the organ in which it resides, a felicitous adaptation of the organ to the object, will be confessed by any one who may happen to have experienced that vitiation of taste which frequently occurs in fevers when every taste is irregular and every one bad. In mentioning the gratifications of the palate, it may be said that we have made choice of a trifling example. I am not of that opinion. They afford a share of enjoyment to man, but to brutes I believe that they are of very great importance. A horse at liberty passes a great part of his waking hours in eating. To the ox, the sheep, the deer, and other ruminating animals, the pleasure is doubled. Their whole time almost is divided between browsing upon their pasture and chewing their cud. Whatever the pleasure be, it is spread over a large portion of their existence. If there be animals, such as the lupus fish, which swallow their prey whole and at once without any time, as it should seem, for either drawing out or relishing the taste in the mouth, is it an improbable conjecture that the seat of taste with them is in the stomach? or at least that a sense of pleasure, whether it be taste or not, accompanies the dissolution of the food in that receptacle, which dissolution in general is carried on very slowly? If this opinion be right, they are more than repaid for the defect of palate. The feast lasts as long as the digestion. In seeking for argument, we need not stay to insist upon the comparative importance of our example, for the observation holds equally of all, or of three at least, of the other senses. The necessary purposes of hearing might have been answered without harmony, of smell without fragrance, of vision without beauty. Now, quote, if the deity had been indifferent about our happiness or misery, we must impute to our good fortune, 
as all design by this supposition is excluded, both the capacity of our senses to receive pleasure and the supply of external objects fitted to excite it. Close quote. I allege these as two felicities, for they are different things, yet both necessary. The sense being formed, the objects which were applied to it might not have suited it. The objects being fixed, the sense might not have agreed with them. A coincidence is here required which no accident can account for. There are three possible suppositions upon the subject, and no more. The first, that the sense, by its original constitution, was made to suit the object. The second, that the object, by its original constitution, was made to suit the sense. The third, that the sense is so constituted as to be able, either universally or within certain limits, by habit and familiarity, to render every object pleasant. Whichever of these suppositions we adopt, the effect evinces, on the part of the author of nature, a studious benevolence. If the pleasures which we derive from any of our senses depend upon an original congruity between the sense and the properties perceived by it, we know by experience that the adjustment demanded, with respect to the qualities which were conferred upon the objects that surround us, not only choice and selection out of a boundless variety of possible qualities with which these objects might have been endued, but a proportioning also of degree, because an excess or defect of intensity spoils the perception as much almost as an error in the kind and nature of the quality. Likewise, the degree of dullness or acuteness in the sense itself is no arbitrary thing, but, in order to preserve the congruity here spoken of, requires to be in an exact or near correspondency with the strength of the impression. The dullness of the senses forms the complaint of old age. Persons in fevers, and, I believe, in most maniacal cases, experience great torment from their preternatural acuteness. An increased, no less than an impaired, sensibility induces a state of disease and suffering. The doctrine of a specific congruity between animal senses and their objects is strongly favored by what is observed of insects in the election of their food. Some of these will feed upon one kind of plant or animal, and upon no other. Some caterpillars upon the cabbage alone, some upon the black currant alone. The species of caterpillar which eats the vine will starve upon the elder, nor will that which we find upon the fennel touch the rose bush. Some insects confine themselves to two or three kinds of plants or animals. Some, again, show so strong a preference as to afford reason to believe that, though they may be driven by hunger to others, they are led by the pleasure of taste to a few particular plants alone. And all this, as it should seem, independently of habit or imitation. But should we accept the third hypothesis, and even carry it so far as to ascribe everything which concerns the question to habit, as in certain species, the human species most particularly, there is reason to attribute something, we have then before us an animal capacity not less perhaps to be admired than the native congruities which the other scheme adopts. It cannot be shown to result from any fixed necessity in nature that what is frequently applied to the senses should of course become agreeable to them. It is, so far as it subsists, a power of accommodation provided in these senses by the author of their structure and forms a part of their perfection. In whichever way we regard the senses, they appear to be specific gifts, ministering not only to preservation but to pleasure. But what we usually call the senses are probably themselves far from being the only vehicles of enjoyment, or the whole of our constitution which is calculated for the same purpose. We have many internal sensations of the most agreeable kind, hardly referable to any of the five senses. Some physiologists have holden that all secretion is pleasurable, and that the complacency which in health, without any external assignable object to excite it, we derive from life itself, is the effect of our secretions going on well within us. All this may be true, but if true, what reason can be assigned for it except the will of the Creator? It may reasonably be asked, why is anything a pleasure? And I know no answer which can be returned to the question, but that which refers it to appointment. We can give no account whatever of our pleasures in the simple and original perception, and even when physical sensations are assumed, we can seldom account for them in the secondary and complicated shapes in which they take the name of diversions. I never yet met with a sportsman who could tell me in what the sport consisted, who could resolve it into its principle and state that principle. I have been a great follower of fishing myself, and in its cheerful solitude have passed some of the happiest hours of a sufficiently happy life but to this moment I could never trace out the source of the pleasure which it afforded me. The quantum in rebus anane, 
whether applied to our amusements or to our graver pursuits, to which in truth it sometimes equally belongs, is always an unjust complaint. If trifles engage, and if trifles make us happy, the true reflection suggested by the experiment is upon the tendency of nature to gratification and enjoyment, which is, in other words, the goodness of its author towards his sensitive creation. Rational natures also, as such, exhibit qualities which help to confirm the truth of our position. The degree of understanding found in mankind is usually much greater than what is necessary for mere preservation. The pleasure of choosing for themselves and of prosecuting the object of their choice should seem to be an original source of enjoyment. The pleasures received from things, great, beautiful, or new, from imitation, or from the liberal arts, are, in some measure, not only superadded, but unmixed gratifications, having no pains to balance them. I do not know whether our attachment to property be not something more than the mere dictate of reason, or even than the mere effect of association. Property communicates a charm to whatever is the object of it. It is the first of our abstract ideas, it cleaves to us the closest and the longest. It endears to the child its plaything, to the peasant his cottage, to the landholder his estate. It supplies the place of prospect and scenery. Instead of coveting the beauty of distant situations, it teaches every man to find it in his own. It gives boldness and grandeur to plains and fens, tinge and coloring to clays and fallows. All these considerations come in aid of our second proposition. The reader will now bear in mind what our two propositions were. They were, firstly, that in a vast plurality of instances in which contrivance is perceived, the design of the contrivance is beneficial. Secondly, that the deity has added pleasure to animal sensations beyond what was necessary for any other purpose, or when the purpose, so far as it was necessary, might have been effected by the operation of pain. Whilst these propositions can be maintained, we are authorized to ascribe to the deity the character of benevolence, and what is benevolence at all must in him be infinite benevolence, by reason of the infinite, that is to say, the incalculably great number of objects upon which it is exercised. End of section 29. Section 30 of Natural Theology by William Paley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26 of the Goodness of the Deity, Part 3. Of the origin of evil, no universal solution has been discovered. I mean, no solution which reaches to all cases of complaint. The most comprehensive is that which arises from the consideration of general rules. We may, I think, without much difficulty, be brought to admit the four following points. First, that important advantages may accrue to the universe from the order of nature proceeding according to general laws. Secondly, that general laws, however well set and constituted, often thwart and cross one another. Thirdly, that from these thwartings and crossings, frequent particular inconveniences will arise, and, fourthly, that it agrees with our observation to suppose that some degree of these inconveniences takes place in the works of nature. These points may be allowed, and it may also be asserted that the general laws with which we are acquainted are directed to beneficial ends. On the other hand, with many of these laws we are not acquainted at all, or we are totally unable to trace them in their branches and in their operation the effect of which ignorance is that they cannot be of importance to us as measures by which to regulate our conduct. The conservation of them may be of importance in other respects, or to other beings, but we are uninformed of their value or use, uninformed, consequently, when and how far they may or may not be suspended, or their effects turned aside, by a presiding and benevolent will, without incurring greater evils than those which would be avoided. The consideration, therefore, of general laws, although it may concern the question of the origin of evil very nearly, which I think it does, rests in views disproportionate to our faculties, and in a knowledge which we do not possess. It serves rather to account for the obscurity of the subject, than to supply us with distinct answers to our difficulties. However, whilst we assent to the above stated propositions, as principles, whatever uncertainty we may find in the application, we lay a ground for believing that cases of apparent evil for which we can suggest no particular reason, are governed by reasons which are more general, which lie deeper in the order of second causes, and which on that account are removed to a greater distance from us. The doctrine of imperfections, or as it is called, evils of imperfections, 
furnishes an account, founded like the former, in views of universal nature. The doctrine is briefly this. It is probable that creation may be better replenished by sensitive beings of different sorts than by sensitive beings all of one sort. It is likewise probable that it may be better replenished by different orders of beings rising one above another in gradation than by beings possessed of equal degrees of perfection. Now, a gradation of such beings implies a gradation of imperfections. No class can justly complain of the imperfections which belong to its place in the scale unless it were allowable for it to complain that a scale of being was appointed in nature, for which appointment there appear to be reasons of wisdom and goodness. In like manner, finiteness, or what is resolvable into finiteness, in inanimate objects, can never be a just subject of complaint, because if it were ever so, it would be always so. We mean that we can never reasonably demand that things should be larger or more when the same demand might be made whatever the quantity or number was. And to me it seems that the sense of mankind has so far acquiesced in these reasons as that we seldom complain of evils of this class, when we clearly perceive them to be such. What I have to add, therefore, is that we ought not to complain of some other evils which stand upon the same foot of vindication as evils of confessed imperfection. We never complain that the globe of our earth is too small, nor should we complain if it were even much smaller. But where is the difference to us between a less globe and a part of the present being uninhabitable? The inhabitants of an island may be apt enough to murmur at the sterility of some parts of it against its rocks or sands or swamps, but no one thinks himself authorized to murmur simply because the island is not larger than it is. Yet these are the same griefs. The above are the two metaphysical answers which have been given to this great question. They are not the worse for being metaphysical, provided they be founded, which I think they are, in right reasoning. But they are of a nature too wide to be brought under our survey, and it is often difficult to apply them in the detail. Our speculations, therefore, are perhaps better employed when they confine themselves within a narrower circle. The observations which follow are of this more limited but more determinate kind. Of bodily pain, the principal observation, no doubt, is that which we have already made and already dwelt upon, viz., that it is seldom the object of contrivance, that, when it is so, the contrivance rests ultimately in good. To which, however, may be added, that the annexing of pain to the means of destruction is a salutary provision, inasmuch as it teaches vigilance and caution, both gives notice of danger and excites those endeavors which may be necessary to preservation. The evil consequence which sometimes arises from the want of that timely intimation of danger which pain gives is known to the inhabitants of cold countries by the example of frost-bitten limbs. I have conversed with patients who had lost toes and fingers by this cause. They have in general told me that they were totally unconscious of any local uneasiness at the time. Some I have heard declare that whilst they were about their employment, neither their situation nor the state of the air was unpleasant. They felt no pain, they suspected no mischief, till, by the application of warmth, they discovered, too late, the fatal injury which some of their extremities had suffered. I say that this shows the use of pain, and that we stand in need of such a monitor. I believe also that the use extends further than we suppose, or can now trace, that to disagreeable sensations we, and all animals, owe or have owed, many habits of action which are salutary, but which are become so familiar as not easily to be referred to their origin. Pain also itself is not without its alleviations. It may be violent and frequent, but it is seldom both violent and long-continued, and its pauses and intermissions become positive pleasures. It has the power of shedding a satisfaction over intervals of ease which, I believe, few enjoyments exceed. A man resting from a fit of the stone, or gout, is, for the time, in possession of feelings which undisturbed health cannot impart. They may be dearly bought, but still they are to be set against the price. And, indeed, it depends upon the duration and urgency of the pain, whether they be dearly bought or not. I am far from being sure that a man is not a gainer by suffering a moderate interruption of bodily ease for a couple of hours out of the four and twenty. Two very common observations favor this opinion. One is that remissions of pain call forth, from those who experience them, stronger expressions of satisfaction and of gratitude towards both the author and the instruments of their relief than are excited by advantages of any other kind. The second is that the spirits of sick men do not sink in proportion to the acuteness of their sufferings, but rather appear to be roused and supported not by pain, 
but by the high degree of comfort which they derive from its cessation or even its subsidency whenever that occurs and which they taste with a relish that diffuses some portion of mental complacency over the whole of that mixed state of sensations in which disease has placed them in connection with bodily pain may be considered bodily disease whether painful or not few diseases are fatal i have before me the account of a dispensary in the neighborhood which states six years experience as follows admitted six thousand four hundred twenty cured five thousand four hundred seventy six dead two hundred thirty four and this i suppose nearly to agree with what other similar institutions exhibit now in all these cases some disorder must have been felt or the patients would not have applied for a remedy yet we see how large a proportion of the maladies which were brought forward have either yielded to proper treatment or what is more probable ceased of their own accord we owe these frequent recoveries and where recovery does not take place this patience of the human constitution under many of the distempers by which it is visited to two benefactions of our nature one is that she works within certain limits allows of a certain latitude within which health may be preserved and within the confines of which it only suffers a graduated diminution different quantities of food different degrees of exercise different portions of sleep different states of the atmosphere are compatible with the possession of health so likewise it is with the secretions and excretions with many internal functions of the body and with the state probably of most of its internal organs they may vary considerably not only without destroying life but without occasioning any high degree of inconveniency the other property of our nature to which we are still more beholden is its constant endeavor to restore itself when disordered to its regular course the fluids of the body appear to possess a power of separating and expelling any noxious substance which may have mixed itself with them this they do in eruptive fevers by a kind of despumation as sydenham calls it analogous in some measure to the intestine action by which fermenting liquors work the yeast to the surface the solids on their part when their action is obstructed not only resume that action as soon as the obstruction is removed but they struggle with the impediment they take an action as near to the true one as the difficulty and the disorganization with which they have to contend will allow of of mortal diseases the great use is to reconcile us to death the horror of death proves the value of life but it is in the power of disease to abate or even extinguish this horror which it does in a wonderful manner and oftentimes by a mild and imperceptible gradation every man who has been placed in a situation to observe it is surprised with the change which has been wrought in himself when he compares the view which he entertains of death upon a sick bed with the heart-sinking dismay with which he should some time ago have met it in health there is no similitude between the sensations of a man led to execution and the calm expiring of a patient at the close of his disease death to him is only the last of a long train of changes in his progress through which it is possible that he may experience no shocks or sudden transitions death itself as a mode of removal and of succession is so connected with the whole order of our animal world that almost everything in that world must be changed to be able to do without it it may seem likewise impossible to separate the fear of death from the enjoyment of life or the perception of that fear from rational natures brutes are in a great measure delivered from all anxiety on this account by the inferiority of their faculties or rather they seem to be armed with the apprehension of death just sufficiently to put them upon the means of preservation and no further but would a human being wish to purchase this immunity at the expense of those mental powers which enable him to look forward to the future death implies separation and the loss of those whom we love must necessarily so far as we can conceive be accompanied with pain to the brute creation nature seems to have stepped in with some secret provision for their relief under the rupture of their attachments in their instincts towards their offspring and of their offspring to them i have often been surprised to observe how ardently they love and how soon they forget the pertinacity of human sorrow upon which time also at length lays its softening hand is probably therefore in some manner connected with the qualities of our rational or moral nature one thing however is clear viz that it is better that we should possess affections the sources of so many virtues and so many joys although they be exposed to the incidents of life as well as the interruptions of mortality than by the want of them be reduced to a state of selfishness apathy and quietism 
of other external evils still confining ourselves to what are called physical or natural evils a considerable part come within the scope of the following observation the great principle of human satisfaction is engagement it is a most just distinction which the late mr tucker has dwelt upon so largely in his works between pleasures in which we are passive and pleasures in which we are active and i believe every attentive observer of human life will assent to his position that however grateful the sensations may occasionally be in which we are passive it is not these but the latter class of our pleasures which constitute satisfaction which supply that regular stream of moderate and miscellaneous enjoyments in which happiness as distinguished from voluptuousness consists now for rational occupation which is in other words for the very material of contented existence there would be no place left if either the things which we had to do were absolutely impracticable to our endeavors or if they were too obedient to our uses a world furnished with advantages on one side and beset with difficulties wants and inconveniences on the other is the proper abode of free rational and active natures being the fittest to stimulate and exercise their faculties the very refractoriness of the objects they have to deal with contributes to this purpose a world in which nothing depended upon ourselves however it might have suited an imaginary race of beings would not have suited mankind their skill prudence industry their various arts and their best attainments from the application of which they draw if not their highest their most permanent gratifications would be insignificant if things could be either moulded by our volitions or of their own accord conformed themselves to our views and wishes now it is in this refractoriness that we discern the seed and principle of physical evil as far as it arises from that which is external to us civil evils or the evils of civil life are much more easily disposed of than physical evils because they are in truth of much less magnitude and also because they result by a kind of necessity not only from the constitution of our nature but from a part of that constitution which no one would wish to see altered the case is this mankind will in every country breed up to a certain point of distress that point may be different in different countries or ages according to the established usages of life in each it will also shift upon the scale so as to admit of a greater or less number of inhabitants according as the quantity of provision which is either produced in the country or supplied to it from other countries may happen to vary but there must always be such a point and the species will always breed up to it the order of generation proceeds by something like a geometrical progression the increase of provision under circumstances even the most advantageous can only assume the form of an arithmetic series whence it follows that the population will always overtake the provision will pass beyond the line of plenty and will continue to increase till checked by the difficulty of procuring subsistence footnote see a statement of this subject in a late treatise upon population End of footnote. such difficulty therefore along with its attendant circumstances must be found in every old country and these circumstances constitute what we call poverty which necessarily imposes labor servitude restraint it seems impossible to people a country with inhabitants who shall be all easy in circumstances for suppose the thing to be done there would be such marrying and giving in marriage amongst them as would in a few years change the face of affairs entirely i e as would increase the consumption of those articles which supplied the natural or habitual wants of the country to such a degree of scarcity as must leave the greatest part of the inhabitants unable to procure them without toilsome endeavors or out of the different kinds of these articles to procure any kind except that which was most easily produced and this in fact describes the condition of the mass of the community in all countries a condition unavoidably as it should seem resulting from the provision which is made in the human in common with all animal constitutions for the perpetuity and multiplication of the species it need not however dishearten any endeavors for the public service to know that population naturally treads upon the heels of improvement if the condition of a people be meliorated the consequence will be either that the mean happiness will be increased or a greater number partake of it or which is most likely to happen that both effects will take place together there may be limits fixed by nature to both but they are limits not yet attained nor even approached in any country of the world and when we speak of limits at all we have respect only to provisions for animal wants there are sources and means and auxiliaries and augmentations of human happiness communicable without restriction of numbers as capable of being possessed by a thousand persons as by one 
such are those which flow from a mild contrasted with a tyrannic government whether civil or domestic those which spring from religion those which grow out of a sense of security those which depend upon habits of virtue sobriety moderation order those lastly which are founded in the possession of well-directed tastes and desires compared with the dominion of tormenting pernicious contradictory unsatisfied and unsatisfiable passions the distinctions of civil life are apt enough to be regarded as evils by those who sit under them but in my opinion with very little reason in the first place the advantages which the higher conditions of life are supposed to confer bear no proportion in value to the advantages which are bestowed by nature the gifts of nature always surpass the gifts of fortune how much for example is activity better than attendance beauty than dress appetite digestion and tranquil bowels than all the studies of cookery or than the most costly compilation of forced or far-fetched dainties nature has a strong tendency to equalization habit the instrument of nature is a great leveller the familiarity which it induces taking off the edge both of our pleasures and our sufferings indulgences which are habitual keep us in ease and cannot be carried much further so that with respect to the gratifications of which the senses are capable the difference is by no means proportionable to the apparatus nay so far as superfluity generates fastidiousness the difference is on the wrong side it is not necessary to contend that the advantages derived from wealth are none under due regulations they are certainly considerable but that they are not greater than they ought to be money is the sweetener of human toil the substitute for coercion the reconciler of labor with liberty it is moreover the stimulant of enterprise in all projects and undertakings as well as of diligence in the most beneficial arts and employments now did affluence when possessed contribute nothing to happiness or nothing beyond the mere supply of necessaries and the secret should come to be discovered we might be in danger of losing great part of the uses which are at present derived to us through this important medium not only would the tranquillity of social life be put in peril by the want of a motive to attach men to their private concerns but the satisfaction which all men receive from success in their respective occupations which collectively constitutes the great mass of human comfort would be done away in its very principle with respect to station as it is distinguished from riches whether it confer authority over others or be invested with honors which apply solely to sentiment and imagination the truth is that what is gained by rising through the ranks of life is not more than sufficient to draw forth the exertions of those who are engaged in the pursuits which lead to advancement and which in general are such as ought to be encouraged distinctions of this sort are subjects much more of competition than of enjoyment and in that competition their use consists it is not as hath been rightly observed by what the lord mayor feels in his coach but by what the apprentice feels who gazes at him that the public is served as we approach the summits of human greatness the comparison of good and evil with respect to personal comfort becomes still more problematical even allowing to ambition all its pleasures the poet asks what is grandeur what is power the philosopher answers constraint and plague et in maxima quaque fortuna minimum licere one very common error misleads the opinion of mankind on this head viz that universally authority is pleasant submission painful in the general course of human affairs the very reverse of this is nearer to the truth command is anxiety obedience ease artificial distinctions sometimes promote real equality whether they be hereditary or be the homage paid to office or the respect attached by public opinion to particular professions they serve to confront that grand and unavoidable distinction which arises from property and which is most overbearing where there is no other it is of the nature of property not only to be irregularly distributed but to run into large masses public laws should be so constructed as to favor its diffusion as much as they can but all that can be done by laws consistently with that degree of government of his property which ought to be left to the subject will not be sufficient to counteract this tendency there must always therefore be the difference between rich and poor and this difference will be the more grinding when no pretension is allowed to be set up against it so that the evils if evils they must be called which spring either from the necessary subordinations of civil life or from the distinctions which have naturally though not necessarily grown up in most societies so long as they are unaccompanied by privileges injurious or oppressive to the rest of the community 
are such as may even by the most depressed ranks be endured with very little prejudice to their comfort the mischiefs of which mankind are the occasion to one another by their private wickedness and cruelties by tyrannical exercises of power by rebellions against just authority by wars by national jealousies and competitions operating to the destruction of third countries or by other instances of misconduct either in individuals or societies are all to be resolved into the character of man as a free agent free agency in its very essence contains liability to abuse yet if you deprive a man of his free agency you subvert his nature you may have order from him and regularity as you may from the tides or the trade winds but you put an end to his moral character to virtue to merit to accountableness to the use indeed of reason to which must be added the observation that even the bad qualities of mankind have an origin in their good ones the case is this human passions are either necessary to human welfare or capable of being made and in a great majority of instances in fact made conducive to its happiness these passions are strong and general and perhaps would not answer their purpose unless they were so but strength and generality when it is expedient that particular circumstances should be respected become if left to themselves excess and misdirection from which excess and misdirection the vices of mankind the causes no doubt of much misery appear to spring this account whilst it shows us the principle of vice shows us at the same time the province of reason and of self-government the want also of every support which can be procured to either from the aids of religion and it shows this without having recourse to any native gratuitous malignity in the human constitution mr hume in his posthumous dialogues asserts indeed of idleness or aversion to labor which he states to lie at the root of a considerable part of the evils which mankind suffer that it is simply and merely bad but how does he distinguish idleness from the love of ease or is he sure that the love of ease in individuals is not the chief foundation of social tranquillity it will be found i believe to be true that in every community there is a large class of its members whose idleness is the best quality about them being the corrective of other bad ones if it were possible in every instance to give a right determination to industry we could never have too much of it but this is not possible if men are to be free and without this nothing would be so dangerous as an incessant universal indefatigable activity in the civil world as well as in the material it is the vis inertiae which keeps things in their order end of section thirty section thirty one of natural theology by william paley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six of the goodness of the deity part four natural theology has ever been pressed with this question why under the regency of a supreme and benevolent will should there be in the world so much as there is of the appearance of chance the question in its whole compass lies beyond our reach but there are not wanting as in the origin of evil answers which seem to have considerable weight in particular cases and also to embrace a considerable number of cases one there must be chance in the midst of design by which we mean that events which are not designed necessarily arise from the pursuit of events which are designed one man travelling to york meets another man travelling to london their meeting is by chance is accidental and so would be called and reckoned though the journeys which produced the meetings were both of them undertaken with design and from deliberation the meeting though accidental was nevertheless hypothetically necessary which is the only sort of necessity that is intelligible for if the two journeys were commenced at the time pursued in the direction and with the speed in which and with which they were in fact begun and performed the meeting could not be avoided there was not therefore the less necessity in it for its being by chance again the rencounter might be most unfortunate though the errands upon which each party set out upon his journey were the most innocent or the most laudable the by effect may be unfavorable without impeachment of the proper purpose for the sake of which the train from the operation of which these consequences ensued was put in motion although no cause act without a good purpose accidental consequences like these may be either good or bad two the appearance of chance will always bear a proportion to the ignorance of the observer 
the cast of a die as regularly follows the laws of motion as the going of a watch yet because we can trace the operation of those laws through the works and movements of the watch and cannot trace them in the shaking and throwing of the die though the laws be the same and prevail equally in both cases we call the turning up of the number of the die chance the pointing of the index of the watch machinery order or by some name which excludes chance it is the same in those events which depend upon the will of a free and rational agent the verdict of a jury the sentence of a judge the resolution of an assembly the issue of a contested election will have more or less of the appearance of chance might be more or less the subject of a wager according as we were less or more acquainted with the reasons which influenced the deliberation the difference resides in the information of the observer and not in the thing itself which in all the cases proposed proceeds from intelligence from mind from counsel from design now when this one cause of the appearance of chance viz the ignorance of the observer comes to be applied to the operations of the deity it is easy to foresee how fruitful it must prove of difficulties and of seeming confusion it is only to think of the deity to perceive what variety of objects what distance of time what extent of space and action his counsels may or rather must comprehend can it be wondered at that of the purposes which dwell in such a mind as this so small a part should be known to us it is only necessary therefore to bear in our thought that in proportion to the inadequateness of our information will be the quantity in the world of apparent chance three in a great variety of cases and of cases comprehending numerous subdivisions it appears for many reasons to be better that events rise up by chance or more properly speaking with the appearance of chance than according to any observable rule whatever this is not seldom the case even in human arrangements each person's place and precedency in a public meeting may be determined by lot work and labor may be allotted tasks and burthens may be allotted operanque laborum partibus aequabat justis aut sorte trahibat military service and station may be allotted the distribution of provision may be made by lot as it is in a sailor's mess in some cases also the distribution of favors may be made by lot in all these cases it seems to be acknowledged that there are advantages in permitting events to chance superior to those which would or could arise from regulation in all these cases also though events rise up in the way of chance it is by appointment that they do so in other events and such as are independent of human will the reasons for this preference of uncertainty to rule appear to be still stronger for example it seems to be expedient that the period of human life should be uncertain did mortality follow any fixed rule it would produce a security in those that were at a distance from it which would lead to the greatest disorders and a horror in those who approached it similar to that which a condemned prisoner feels on the night before his execution but that death be uncertain the young must sometimes die as well as the old also were deaths never sudden they who are in health would be too confident of life the strong and the active who want most to be warned and checked would live without apprehension or restraint on the other hand were sudden deaths very frequent the sense of constant jeopardy would interfere too much with the degree of ease and enjoyment intended for us and human life be too precarious for the business and interests which belong to it there could not be dependence either upon our own lives or the lives of those with whom we were connected sufficient to carry on the regular offices of human society the manner therefore in which death is made to occur conduces to the purposes of admonition without overthrowing the necessary stability of human affairs disease being the forerunner of death there is the same reason for its attacks coming upon us under the appearance of chance as there is for uncertainty in the time of death itself the seasons are a mixture of regularity and chance they are regular enough to authorize expectation whilst their being in a considerable degree irregular induces on the part of the cultivators of the soil a necessity for personal attendance for activity vigilance precaution it is this necessity which creates farmers which divides the profit of the soil between the owner and the occupier which by requiring expedience by increasing employment and by rewarding expenditure promotes agricultural arts and agricultural life of all modes of life the best being the most conducive to health to virtue to enjoyment i believe it to be found in fact that where the soil is the most fruitful and the seasons the most constant 
There the condition of the cultivators of the earth is the most depressed. Uncertainty, therefore, has its use even to those who sometimes complain of it the most. Seasons of scarcity themselves are not without their advantages. They call forth new exertions, they set contrivance and ingenuity at work, they give birth to improvements in agriculture and economy, they promote the investigation and management of public resources. Again, there are strong intelligible reasons why there should exist in human society great disparity of wealth and station, not only as these things are acquired in different degrees, but at the first setting out of life. In order, for instance, to answer the various demands of civil life, there ought to be amongst the members of every civil society a diversity of education, which can only belong to an original diversity of circumstances. As this sort of disparity, which ought to take place from the beginning of life, must, ex hypothesis, be previous to the merit or demerit of the persons upon whom it falls, can it be better disposed of than by chance? Parentage is that sort of chance, yet it is the commanding circumstance which in general fixes each man's place in civil life, along with everything which appertains to its distinctions. It may be the result of a beneficial rule that the fortunes or honors of the father devolve upon the son, and, as it should seem, of a still more necessary rule, that the low or laborious condition of the parent be communicated to his family. But, with respect to the successor himself, it is the drawing of a ticket in a lottery. Inequalities, therefore, of fortune, at least the greatest part of them, viz. those which attend us from our birth, and depend upon our birth, may be left as they are left to chance, without any just cause for questioning the regency of a supreme disposer of events. But not only the donation, when by the necessity of the case they must be gifts, but even the acquirability of civil advantages ought perhaps, in a considerable degree, to lie at the mercy of chance. Some would have all the virtuous rich, or at least removed from the evils of poverty, without perceiving, I suppose, the consequence that all the poor must be wicked. And how such a society could be kept in subjection to government has not been shown. For the poor, that is, they who seek their subsistence by constant manual labor, must still form the mass of the community. Otherwise, the necessary labor of life could not be carried on. The work would not be done which the wants of mankind in a state of civilization, and still more in a state of refinement, require to be done. It appears to be also true that the exigencies of social life call not only for an original diversity of external circumstances, but for a mixture of different faculties, tastes, and tempers. Activity and contemplation, restlessness and quiet, courage and timidity, ambition and contentedness, not to say even indolence and dullness, are all wanted in the world, all conduce to the well-going on of human affairs, just as the rudder, the sails, and the ballast of a ship all perform their part in the navigation. Now, since these characters require for their foundation different original talents, different dispositions, perhaps also different bodily constitutions, and since, likewise, it is apparently expedient that they be promiscuously scattered amongst the different classes of society, can the distribution of talents, dispositions, and the constitutions upon which they depend be better made than by chance? The opposites of apparent chance are constancy and sensible interposition, every degree of secret direction being consistent with it. Now, of constancy, or of fixed and known rules, we have seen in some cases the inapplicability, and inconveniences which we do not see might attend their application in other cases. Of sensible interposition, we may be permitted to remark that a providence, always and certainly distinguishable, would be neither more nor less than miracles rendered frequent and common. It is difficult to judge of the state into which this would throw us. It is enough to say that it would cast us upon a quite different dispensation from that under which we live. It would be a total and radical change, and the change would deeply affect, or perhaps subvert, the whole conduct of human affairs. I can readily believe that, other circumstances being adapted to it, such a state might be better than our present state. It may be the state of other beings. It may be ours hereafter. But the question with which we are now concerned is, how far it would be consistent with our condition, supposing it in other respects to remain as it is. And in this question there seem to be reasons of great moment on the negative side. For instance, so long as bodily labor continues on so many accounts to be necessary for the bulk of mankind, any dependency upon supernatural aid, by unfixing those motives which promote exertion, or by relaxing those habits which engender patient industry, might introduce negligence, inactivity, and disorder into the most useful occupations of human life, 
and thereby deteriorate the condition of human life itself. As moral agents, we should experience a still greater alteration, of which more will be said under the next article. Although, therefore, the deity, who possesses the power of winding and turning as he pleases, the course of causes which issue from himself, do in fact interpose to alter or intercept effects which without such interposition would have taken place, yet is it by no means incredible that his providence, which always rests upon final good, may have made a reserve with respect to the manifestation of his interference, a part of the very plan which he has appointed for our terrestrial existence, and a part conformable with, or in some sort required by, other parts of the same plan. It is at any rate evident that a large and ample province remains for the exercise of providence, without its being naturally perceptible by us, because obscurity, when applied to the interruption of laws, bears a necessary proportion to the imperfection of our knowledge when applied to the laws themselves, or rather to the effects which these laws, under their various and incalculable combinations, would of their own accord produce. And if it be said that the doctrine of divine providence, by reason of the ambiguity under which its exertions present themselves, can be attended with no practical influence upon our conduct, that although we believe ever so firmly that there is a providence, we must prepare and provide and act as if there were none. I answer that this is admitted, and that we further allege that so to prepare and so to provide is consistent with the most perfect assurance of the reality of a providence, and not only so, but that it is, probably, one advantage of the present state of our information, that our provisions and preparations are not disturbed by it. Or, if it be still asked, of what use at all, then, is the doctrine, if it neither alter our measures nor regulate our conduct? I answer again that it is of the greatest use, but that it is a doctrine of sentiment and piety, not, immediately at least, of action or conduct, that it applies to the consolation of men's minds, to their devotions, to the excitement of gratitude, the support of patience, the keeping alive and the strengthening of every motive for endeavoring to please our Maker, and that these are great uses. Of all views under which human life has ever been considered, the most reasonable, in my judgment, is that which regards it as a state of probation. If the course of the world were separated from the contrivances of nature, I do not know that it would be necessary to look for any other account of it than what, if it may be called an account, is contained in the answer that events rise up by chance. But since the contrivances of nature decidedly evince intention, and since the course of the world and the contrivances of nature have the same author, we are, by the force of this connection, led to believe that the appearance under which events take place is reconcilable with the supposition of design on the part of the deity. It is enough that they be reconcilable with this supposition, and it is undoubtedly true that they may be reconcilable, though we cannot reconcile them. The mind, however, which contemplates the works of nature, and, in those works, sees so much of means directed to ends, of beneficial effects brought about by wise expedients, of concerted trains of causes terminating in the happiest results, so much in a word of counsel, intention, and benevolence, a mind, I say, drawn into the habit of thought which these observations excite, can hardly turn its view to the condition of our own species without endeavouring to suggest to itself some purpose, some design, for which the state in which we are placed is fitted, and which it is made to serve. Now we assert the most probable supposition to be that it is a state of moral probation, and that many things in it suit with this hypothesis, which suit with no other. It is not a state of unmixed happiness, or of happiness simply. It is not a state of designed misery, or of misery simply. It is not a state of retribution. It is not a state of punishment. It suits with none of these suppositions. It accords much better with the idea of its being a condition calculated for the production, exercise, and improvement of moral qualities, with a view to a future state in which these qualities, after being so produced, exercised, and improved, may, by a new and more favoring constitution of things, receive their reward or become their own. If it be said that this is to enter upon a religious rather than a philosophical consideration, I answer that the name of religion ought to form no objection, if it shall turn out to be the case that the more religious our views are, the more probability they contain. The degree of beneficence, of benevolent intention, and of power, exercised in the construction of sensitive beings, goes strongly in favor, not only of a creative, but of a continuing care, that is, of a ruling providence. The degree of chance which appears to prevail in the world requires to be reconciled with this hypothesis. Now, it is one thing to maintain the doctrine of providence along with that of a future state, and another thing without it. 
In my opinion, the two doctrines must stand or fall together. For although more of this apparent chance may perhaps, upon other principles, be accounted for than is generally supposed, yet a future state alone rectifies all disorders, and if it can be shown that the appearance of disorder is consistent with the uses of life as a preparatory state, or that in some respects it promotes these uses, then, so far as this hypothesis may be accepted, the ground of the difficulty is done away. In the wide scale of human condition, there is not perhaps one of its manifold diversities which does not bear upon the design here suggested. Virtue is infinitely various. There is no situation in which a rational being is placed, from that of the best instructed Christian down to the condition of the rudest barbarian, which affords not room for moral agency, for the acquisition, exercise, and display of voluntary qualities good and bad. Health and sickness, enjoyment and suffering, riches and poverty, knowledge and ignorance, power and subjection, liberty and bondage, civilization and barbarity, have all their offices and duties, all serve for the formation of character. For when we speak of a state of trial, it must be remembered that characters are not only tried, or proved, or detected, but that they are generated also, and formed by circumstances. The best dispositions may subsist under the most depressed, the most afflicted fortunes. A West Indian slave, who, amidst his wrongs, retains his benevolence, I, for my part, look upon as amongst the foremost of human candidates for the rewards of virtue. The kind master of such a slave, that is, he who, in the exercise of an inordinate authority, postpones in any degree his own interest to his slave's comfort, is likewise a meritorious character, but still he is inferior to his slave. All, however, which I contend for is, that these destinies, opposite as they may be in every other view, are both trials, and equally such. The observation may be applied to every other condition, to the whole range of the scale, not excepting even its lowest extremity. Savages appear to us all alike, but it is owing to the distance at which we view savage life that we perceive in it no discrimination of character. I make no doubt but that moral qualities, both good and bad, are called into action as much, and that they subsist in as great variety in these inartificial societies as they are or do in polished life. Certain, at least, it is, that the good and ill treatment which each individual meets with depends more upon the choice and voluntary conduct of those about him than it does or ought to do under regular civil institutions and the coercion of public laws. So again, to turn our eyes to the other end of the scale, namely, that part of it which is occupied by mankind enjoying the benefits of learning, together with the lights of revelation, they are also the advantages all along probationary. Christianity itself, I mean the revelation of Christianity, is not only a blessing, but a trial. It is one of the diversified means by which the character is exercised. And they who require of Christianity that the revelation of it should be universal, may possibly be found to require that one species of probation should be adopted, if not to the exclusion of others, at least to the narrowing of that variety which the wisdom of the deity hath appointed to this part of his moral economy. Footnote. The reader will observe that I speak of the revelation of Christianity as distinct from Christianity itself. The dispensation may already be universal. That part of mankind which never heard of Christ's name may nevertheless be redeemed, that is, be placed in a better condition with respect to their future state by his intervention, may be the objects of his benignity and intercession, as well as of the propitiatory virtue of his passion. But this is not natural theology, therefore I will not dwell longer upon it. End of footnote. Now, if this supposition be well founded, that is, if it be true that our ultimate or our most permanent happiness will depend not upon the temporary condition into which we are cast, but upon our behavior in it, then is it a much more fit subject of chance than we usually allow or apprehend it to be, in what manner the variety of external circumstances which subsist in the human world is distributed amongst the individuals of the species. This life being a state of probation, it is immaterial, says Rousseau, quote, what kinds of trials we experience in it, provided they produce their effects. Close quote. Of two agents who stand indifferent to the moral governor of the universe, one may be exercised by riches, the other by poverty. The treatment of these two shall appear to be very opposite, whilst in truth it is the same. For though in many respects there be great disparity between the conditions assigned, in one main article there may be none, viz., in that they are alike trials, have both their duties and temptations, not less arduous or less dangerous in one case than the other, 
so that, if the final award follow the character, the original distribution of the circumstances under which that character is formed may be defended upon principles not only of justice but of equality. What hinders, therefore, but that mankind may draw lots for their condition? They take their portion of faculties and opportunities as any unknown cause or concourse of causes or as causes acting for other purposes may happen to set them out. But the event is governed by that which depends upon themselves, the application of what they have received. In dividing the talents, no rule was observed. None was necessary. In rewarding the use of them, that of the most correct justice. The chief difference at last appears to be that the right use of more talents, i.e. of a greater trust, will be more highly rewarded than the right use of fewer talents, i.e. of a less trust. And since, for other purposes, it is expedient that there be an inequality of concredited talents here, as well probably as an inequality of conditions hereafter, though all remuneratory, can any rule adapted to that inequality be more agreeable even to our apprehensions of distributive justice than this is? We have said that the appearance of casualty which attends the occurrences and events of life not only does not interfere with its uses as a state of probation, but that it promotes these uses. Passive virtues, of all others the severest and the most sublime, of all others perhaps the most acceptable to the deity, would, it is evident, be excluded from a constitution in which happiness and misery regularly followed virtue and vice. Patience and composure, under distress, affliction, and pain, a steadfast keeping up of our confidence in God and of our reliance upon his final goodness at the time when everything present is adverse and discouraging, and, what is no less difficult to retain, a cordial desire for the happiness of others, even when we are deprived of our own, these dispositions, which constitute perhaps the perfection of our moral nature, would not have found their proper office and object in a state of avowed retribution, and in which, consequently, endurance of evil would be only submission to punishment. Again, one man's sufferings may be another man's trial. The family of a sick parent is a school of filial piety. The charities of domestic life, and not only these, but all the social virtues, are called out by distress but then misery to be the proper object of mitigation, or of that benevolence which endeavors to relieve, must be really or apparently casual. It is upon such sufferings alone that benevolence can operate. For were there no evils in the world, but what were punishments, properly and intelligibly such, benevolence would only stand in the way of justice. Such evils, consistently with the administration of moral government, could not be prevented or alleviated, that is to say, could not be remitted in whole or in part, except by the authority which inflicted them, or by an appellate or superior authority. This consideration, which is founded in our most acknowledged apprehensions of the nature of penal justice, may possess its weight in the divine counsels. Virtue, perhaps, is the greatest of all ends. In human beings, relative virtues form a large part of the whole. Now relative virtue presupposes not only the existence of evil, without which it could have no object, no material to work upon, but that evils be, apparently at least, misfortunes, that is, the effects of apparent chance. It may be in pursuance, therefore, and in furtherance of the same scheme of probation, that the evils of life are made so to present themselves. I have already observed that, when we let in religious considerations, we often let in light upon the difficulties of nature. So, in the fact now to be accounted for, the degree of happiness, which we usually enjoy in this life, may be better suited to a state of trial and probation than a greater degree would be. The truth is, we are rather too much delighted with the world than too little. Imperfect, broken, and precarious as our pleasures are, they are more than sufficient to attach us to the eager pursuit of them. A regard to a future state can hardly keep its place as it is. If we were designed, therefore, to be influenced by that regard, might not a more indulgent system, a higher or more uninterrupted state of gratification, have interfered with the design? At least it seems expedient that mankind should be susceptible of this influence when presented to them, that the condition of the world should not be such as to exclude its operation or even to weaken it more than it does. In a religious view, however we may complain of them in every other, privation, disappointment, and satiety are not without the most salutary tendencies. End of section 31《
in all cases wherein the mind feels itself in danger of being confounded by variety, it is sure to rest upon a few strong points, or perhaps upon a single instance. Amongst a multitude of proofs, it is one that does the business. If we observe in any argument that hardly two minds fix upon the same instance, the diversity of choice shows the strength of the argument, because it shows the number and competition of the examples. There is no subject in which the tendency to dwell upon select or single topics is so usual, because there is no subject of which, in its full extent, the latitude is so great, as that of natural history applied to the proof of an intelligent creator. For my part, I take my stand in human anatomy, and the examples of mechanism I should be apt to draw out from the copious catalogue which it supplies are the pivot upon which the head turns, the ligament within the socket of the hip joint, the pulley or trochlear muscles of the eye, the epiglottis, the bandages which tie down the tendons of the wrist and instep, the slit or perforated muscles at the hands and feet, the knitting of the intestines to the mesentery, the course of the chyle into the blood, and the constitution of the sexes as extended throughout the whole of the animal creation. To these instances the reader's memory will go back, as they are severally set forth in their places. There is not one of the number which I do not think decisive, not one which is not strictly mechanical. Nor have I read or heard of any solution of these appearances which, in the smallest degree, shakes the conclusion that we build upon them. But of the greatest part of those who, either in this book or any other, read arguments to prove the existence of a god, it will be said that they leave off only where they began, that they were never ignorant of this great truth, never doubted of it, that it does not therefore appear what is gained by researches from which no new opinion is learnt, and upon the subject of which no proofs were wanted. Now I answer that, by investigation, the following points are always gained in favor of doctrines even the most generally acknowledged, supposing them to be true, viz. stability and impression. Occasions will arise to try the firmness of our most habitual opinions, and upon these occasions it is a matter of incalculable use to feel our foundation, to find a support in argument for what we had taken up upon authority. In the present case, the arguments upon which the conclusion rests are exactly such as a truth of universal concern ought to rest upon. They are sufficiently open to the views and capacities of the unlearned, at the same time that they acquire new strength and luster from the discoveries of the learned. If they had been altogether abstruse and recondite, they would not have found their way to the understandings of the mass of mankind. If they had been merely popular, they might have wanted solidity. But, secondly, what is gained by research, in the stability of our conclusion, is also gained from it in impression. Physicians tell us that there is a great deal of difference between taking a medicine and the medicine getting into the constitution, a difference not unlike which obtains with respect to those great moral propositions which ought to form the directing principles of human conduct. It is one thing to assent to a proposition of this sort, another, and a very different thing, to have properly imbibed its influence. I take the case to be this, perhaps almost every man living has a particular train of thought into which his mind glides and falls when at leisure from the impressions and ideas that occasionally excite it. Perhaps also the train of thought here spoken of, more than any other thing, determines the character. It is of the utmost consequence, therefore, that this property of our constitution be well regulated. Now it is by frequent or continued meditation upon a subject, by placing a subject in different points of view, by induction of particulars, by variety of examples, by applying principles to the solution of phenomena, by dwelling upon proofs and consequences, that mental exercise is drawn into any particular channel. It is by these means, at least, that we have any power over it. The train of spontaneous thought, and the choice of that train, may be directed to different ends, and may appear to be more or less judiciously fixed, according to the purpose in respect of which we consider it. But in a moral view, I shall not, I believe, be contradicted when I say that, if one train of thinking be more desirable than another, it is that which regards the phenomena of nature with a constant reference to a supreme intelligent author. To have made this the ruling, the habitual sentiment of our minds, is to have laid the foundation of everything which is religious. The world thenceforth becomes a temple, and life itself one continued act of adoration. The change is no less than this, that, whereas formerly God was seldom in our thoughts, we can now scarcely look upon anything without perceiving its relation to him. Every organized natural body, in the provisions which it contains for its sustentation and propagation, 
testifies a care on the part of the Creator expressly directed to these purposes. We are on all sides surrounded by such bodies, examined in their parts, wonderfully curious, compared with one another, no less wonderfully diversified, so that the mind as well as the eye may either expatiate in variety and multitude, or fix itself down to the investigation of particular divisions of the science. And in either case it will rise up from its occupation, possessed by the subject in a very different manner, and with a very different degree of influence, from what a mere assent to any verbal proposition which can be formed concerning the existence of the deity, at least that merely complying assent with which those about us are satisfied, and with which we are too apt to satisfy ourselves, will or can produce upon the thoughts. More especially may this difference be perceived in the degree of admiration and of awe with which the divinity is regarded when represented to the understanding by its own remarks, its own reflections, and its own reasonings, compared with what is excited by any language that can be used by others. The works of nature want only to be contemplated. When contemplated, they have everything in them which can astonish by their greatness, for of the vast scale of operation through which our discoveries carry us, at one end we see an intelligent power arranging planetary systems, fixing, for instance, the trajectory of Saturn, or constructing a ring of 200,000 miles diameter to surround his body, and be suspended like a magnificent arch over the heads of his inhabitants, and at the other, bending a hooked tooth, concerting and providing an appropriate mechanism for the clasping and reclasping of the filaments of the feather of a hummingbird. We have proof not only of both these works proceeding from an intelligent agent, but of their proceeding from the same agent. For in the first place we can trace an identity of plan, a connection of system, from Saturn to our own globe, and when arrived upon our globe we can, in the second place, pursue the connection through all the organized, especially the animated, bodies which it supports. We can observe marks of a common relation as well to one another as to the elements of which their habitation is composed. Therefore one mind hath planned, or at least hath prescribed a general plan for, all these productions. One being has been concerned in all. Under this stupendous being we live. Our happiness, our existence, is in his hands. All we expect must come from him. Nor ought we to feel our situation insecure. In every nature, and in every portion of nature which we can descry, we find attention bestowed upon even the minutest parts. The hinges in the wings of an earwig, and the joints of its antennae, are as highly wrought as if the Creator had nothing else to finish. We see no signs of diminution of care by multiplicity of objects, or of distraction of thought by variety. We have no reason to fear, therefore, our being forgotten, or overlooked, or neglected. The existence and character of the Deity is, in every view, the most interesting of all human speculations. In none, however, is it more so than as it facilitates the belief of the fundamental articles of revelation. It is a step to have it proved that there must be something in the world more than what we see. It is a further step to know that amongst the invisible things of nature there must be an intelligent mind concerned in its production, order, and support. These points being assured to us by natural theology, we may well leave to revelation the disclosure of many particulars which our researches cannot reach, respecting either the nature of this being, as the original cause of all things, or his character and designs as a moral governor. And not only so, but the more full confirmation of other particulars, of which, though they do not lie altogether beyond our reasonings and our probabilities, the certainty is by no means equal to the importance. The true theist will be the first to listen to any credible communication of divine knowledge. Nothing which he has learned from natural theology will diminish his desire of further instruction or his disposition to receive it with humility and thankfulness. He wishes for light, he rejoices in light. His inward veneration of this great being will incline him to attend with the utmost seriousness not only to all that can be discovered concerning him by researches into nature, but to all that is taught by a revelation which gives reasonable proof of having proceeded from him. But above every other article of revealed religion does the anterior belief of a deity bear with the strongest force upon that grand point which gives indeed interest and importance to all the rest, the resurrection of the human dead. The thing might appear hopeless did we not see a power at work adequate to the effect, a power under the guidance of an intelligent will, and a power penetrating the inmost recesses of all substance. I am far from justifying the opinion of those who thought it a thing incredible that God should raise the dead. But I admit that it is first necessary to be persuaded that there is a God to do so. This being thoroughly settled in our minds, 
there seems to be nothing in this process, concealed as we confess it to be, which need to shock our belief. They who have taken up the opinion that the acts of the human mind depend upon organization, that the mind itself indeed consists in organization, are supposed to find a greater difficulty than others do in admitting a transition by death to a new state of sentient existence, because the old organization is apparently dissolved. But I do not see that any impracticability need be apprehended even by these, or that the change, even upon their hypothesis, is far removed from the analogy of some other operations which we know with certainty that the deity is carrying on. In the ordinary derivation of plants and animals from one another, a particle in many cases minuter than all assignable, all conceivable dimension, an aura, an effluvium, an infinitesimal, determines the organization of a future body, does no less than fix whether that which is about to be produced shall be a vegetable, a merely sentient or a rational being, an oak, a frog, or a philosopher, makes all these differences, gives to the future body its qualities and nature and species. And this particle, from which springs, and by which is determined, a whole future nature, itself proceeds from, and owes its constitution to, a prior body. Nevertheless, which is seen in plants most decisively, the incepted organization, though formed within, and through, and by, a preceding organization, is not corrupted by its corruption, or destroyed by its dissolution, but, on the contrary, is sometimes extricated and developed by those very causes, survives and comes into action when the purpose for which it was prepared requires its use. Now, an economy which nature has adopted, when the purpose was to transfer an organization from one individual to another, may have something analogous to it when the purpose is to transmit an organization from one state of being to another state, and they who found thought in organization may see something in this analogy applicable to their difficulties. For whatever can transmit a similarity of organization will answer their purpose, because, according even to their own theory, it may be the vehicle of consciousness, and because consciousness carries identity and individuality along with it through all changes of form or visible qualities. In the most general case, that, as we have said, of the derivation of plants and animals from one another, the latent organization is either itself similar to the old organization, or has the power of communicating to new matter the old organic form. But it is not restricted to this rule. There are other cases, especially in the progress of insect life, in which the dormant organization does not much resemble that which encloses it, and still less suits with the situation in which the enclosing body is placed, but suits with a different situation to which it is destined. In the larva of the libellula, which lives constantly and has still long to live under water, are described the wings of a fly, which two years afterwards is to mount into the air. Is there nothing in this analogy? It serves at least to show that even in the observable course of nature, organizations are formed one beneath another, and amongst a thousand other instances, it shows completely that the deity can mold and fashion the parts of material nature so as to fulfill any purpose whatever which he is pleased to appoint. They who refer the operations of mind to a substance totally and essentially different from matter, as most certainly these operations, though affected by material causes, hold very little affinity to any properties of matter with which we are acquainted, adopt perhaps a juster reasoning and a better philosophy. And by these the considerations above suggested are not wanted, at least in the same degree. But to such as find, which some persons do find, an insuperable difficulty in shaking off an adherence to these analogies, which the corporeal world is continually suggesting to their thoughts, to such, I say, every consideration will be a relief which manifests the extent of that intelligent power which is acting in nature, the fruitfulness of its resources, the variety and aptness and success of its means, most especially every consideration which tends to show that in the translation of a conscious existence there is not, even in their own way of regarding it, anything greatly beyond or totally unlike what takes place in such parts, probably small parts, of the order of nature as are accessible to our observation. Again, if there be those who think that the contractedness and debility of the human faculties in our present state seem ill to accord with the high destinies which the expectations of religion point out to us, I would only ask them whether any one who saw a child two hours after its birth could suppose that it would ever come to understand fluxions, or who then shall say what farther amplification of intellectual powers, what accession of knowledge, what advance and improvement the rational faculty, be its constitution what it will, 
may not admit of when placed amidst new objects and endowed with a sensorium adapted as it undoubtedly will be and as our present senses are to the perception of those substances and of those properties of things with which our concern may lie upon the whole in everything which respects this awful but as we trust glorious change we have a wise and powerful being the author in nature of infinitely various expedients for infinitely various ends upon whom to rely for the choice and appointment of means adequate to the execution of any plan which his goodness or his justice may have formed for the moral and accountable part of his terrestrial creation that great office rests with him be it ours to hope and prepare under a firm and subtle persuasion that living and dying we are his that life is passed in his constant presence that death resigns us to his merciful disposal end of section thirty two End of Natural Theology, or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature, by William Paley.